Cymru, but I understand that this is in very early stages <coughs> and the implementation of any scheme may be a number uh, of years away. Many thanks. And that concludes portfolio questions. And we now move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 11980 in the name of Derek Mackay on active travel. I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. I would like to inform members that we are extraordinarily tight for time today, so times will be adhered to, please. And I now call on the Minister, Derek Mackay, to speak to and move the motion. Minister, your 14 minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'm delighted to uh, be here for the first government-led debate as a uh, Minister uh, for Transport and Islands, and I'd like to particularly welcome David Stewart to his position uh, within the Labour Party. We have worked very well, I think, in the past, including government supporting David Stewart's legislation. Maybe that consensual and constructive approach is one that we can take forward in the Transport and Islands agenda as well, and on a wider note of consensus and a constructive uh, approach, that offer, of course, is made uh, to all parties where there is a great deal of agreement and consensus around the vision for the type of Scotland that we would like to have uh, in terms uh, of transport uh, and active uh, travel. Uh, the purpose of the motion is to celebrate and share the success of active travel projects in Scotland since the establishment of this Scottish Parliament, and also to take stock and consider further actions. So I'll be very keen to hear all members' views. On that note, I can say I intend to accept the Labour amendment as a reasonable contribution to the debate. I want to celebrate and build upon the projects that are making a difference, and in relation to participation in active travel, I know whilst we have some way to go in the general population, young people uh, are leading the way. Uh, for example, a survey showed that over 50% of school children uh, travelled actively to school. Uh, presiding officer, it is fitting that in this year, the 20th anniversary of the National Cycle Network, that we recognise the efforts of all partners and commit to working together to continue to promote active travel. And I look forward to hearing from Sustrans about the celebrations they are planning uh, for the National Cycle Network anniversary and hope to take part in some of them. As today's motion says, we have made progress since 1999. Uh, we now have the second Cycling Action Plan for Scotland, outlining the 19 actions that will help us achieve our shared vision of 10% of everyday journeys by bike uh, by 2020. We have also our first ever national walking strategy, Let's Get Scotland Walking. Paths for All is leading on the development of the action plan for this strategy, which will be launched in spring 2015. This will include actions aimed at improving walking environments to help increase levels of functional walking. And most recently, we published our active travel vision, setting out what Scotland will look like in 2030 if more people choose walking and cycling as their everyday form of travel for shorter journeys. We have also had the National Planning Framework 3, which includes plans for a national long-distance walking and cycling network and plans to implement the Town Centre Action Plan through the Charette Programme, which will complement the Community Links Programme run by Sestrans. I am very keen to ensure the planning system something I pursued when Planning Minister makes all the right connections, if you'll pardon the pun, and I intend to meet again with my former planning officials to continue with this work. And I'd like to thank all the stakeholders who contributed to all the documents and strategies that provide us with the vision and action points, and I look forward to working with all stakeholders in future in delivering them. This year sees the largest ever Scottish Government investment in cycling and walking, almost £40 million. And bear in mind, much of this investment is matched by partners, for example, through the Community Links programme of £19 million. This so has generated some £25 million in match funding in 2015. Uh, of course. I'm grateful, for, and, and I'm grateful for him outlining the very important investment that has been made in active travel. 
on behalf of one of my constituents, I want to just help me clear up a matter, Minister. Um, one of my constituents is concerned that in November there was a £214 million additional cycling investment was announced in England by Nick Clegg. Is the Minister able to tell me, was that new money, uh, was it Barnet consequential, or was it just taken from other areas of the transport budget and re-announced? Minister. Yeah, I found how complex uh, the budget lines uh, are uh, within the transport portfolio, partly because there are different portfolios that contribute to active travel uh, and cycling. It's actually one of the reasons I'll accept the Labour amendment, to give further clarity to the spending uh, on uh, this area, which I think is the right thing to do. But in terms of funding announcements, new announcements have been additional money allocated uh, to these tasks. So I hope that reassures uh, the member and his constituents. In terms of an additional uh, £10 million, there is an issue around financial transactions, which isn't actually the first place at £5 million you would want to go to fund capital improvements. But we have to be creative, do we not, with such drastic reductions to our capital budget from Westminster. Now, if that £5 million financial transactions cannot be spent on cycling, here is the commitment that's already been made and will be delivered. We'll find that resource from elsewhere in the transport budget to ensure that we meet the commitment uh, that we've made uh, publicly. But we will find new ways of working to uh, innovate and, and, and uh, support uh, active travel. So I hope that uh, answers uh, the question. And in that note, with that shared responsibility around uh, cycling and uh, active travel, we need to continue with that partnership approach. And I will harness the energy that I know exists with my uh, local government uh, colleagues uh, as well. Uh, in terms of uh, further announcements on uh, funding, there, there will be some uh, in due course. And I've written to Spokes uh, Lothian Cycle Campaign Group confirming the 2015-16 budget for cycling uh, and uh, walking. Um, the, the monies that have been announced will support both improved infrastructure and supporting behaviour change projects because behaviour change is essential if we were to make the transformation uh, that's been outlined. Now, the message that cycling and walking benefits all of us is firmly out there. There are a raft of projects being delivered and a range of funding sources to support them. Our message is clear. By choosing active travel, you're cutting carbon emissions and pollution caused by short car journeys. Uh, by building high-quality cycle routes and paths, we're helping school children to walk, scoot and cycle safely to school, thereby cutting congestion caused by the school run. And by supporting behaviour change projects, we're encouraging more people to cycle and walk to work, uh, to college and university, to the shops and to appointments, which is good for our health and should be part of our daily routines. And today I want to focus on those projects which have been supported by Scottish Government that have made uh, a difference. As I said, acts of uh, travel should be part of our everyday life from the earliest years. So I'm going to start with children and schools. Since 1999, cycle training at schools across Scotland has changed significantly. The cycle proficiency test is now Bikeability Scotland and we now have 38% of primary schools offering Bikeability Scotland on-road cycle training, and this is up from 32% just three years ago. Achieved, uh, of course. Claudia Beamish. For taking the short intervention. Uh, just to clarify what plans there are, and I apologise if he, were going to, he was going to go on to raise that, about uh, raising uh, it much higher, the percentage of on-road cycling uh, in Bikeability Scotland for primary uh, pupils, because I do believe that's very important as an ex-primary teacher. Minister? Uh, Claudia Beamish is absolutely right. That uh, level is not to our satisfaction. On this and many other action points, we want to do more uh, with our partners. And I'll be able to cover a, a great many of the points within the action plan and progress made and what else we want to do uh, through the uh, update report, the monitoring report. The next one, I understand, will be published uh, uh, in terms of uh, that committee for February, and that will be able to flesh out uh, more of the detailed points around progress uh, that's currently uh, being uh, uh, made, and we can increase uh, that number. Uh, so too, uh, at schools where Sustrans iBike officers are helping schools to deliver cycling activities, we have seen there uh, an average increase of 7% in the number of pupils cycling, especially amongst young girls, which is particularly important for sustaining this practice when they go to secondary uh, school as well. There's 
uh, cycle-friendly schools and numerous safer routes to school projects, uh, as well as a new project, new pilot project called School Cycle Camps, uh, which ran this autumn for the first time. Aimed at 16-year-olds, it has funded one week uh, residential cycle courses where volunteers learned basic bike mechanics and were accredited with cycle training assistant certificates, which will allow them now to go in turn and train their uh, fellow uh, students. Cycling Scotland uh, received applications from a number uh, of schools to uh, promote uh, cycling and will continue to support that work. That, incidentally, is one of the projects that isn't necessarily funded by the transport budget, but from the environment budget, further making the point that this cuts across a portfolio. Uh, Cycling Scotland is also working with students in five further and higher education campuses to encourage more active travel in and around universities and colleges, and grants are available for events, signage, cycle hire and cycle parking, and I look forward to, to their uh, extension uh, in the near uh, future. Uh, towns and cities across Scotland will see investment in both community links projects and cycle-friendly community wards as well. And this year alone there are 180 community links projects being administered by Sistrans in partnership with some 40 organisations, but mostly with local authorities and regional transport uh, partnerships. And nearly £500,000 has been awarded to 66 grassroots community groups through the Cycle Friendly and Sustainable Community Scheme, which was set up during the last spending uh, review. On a larger scale, in September last year, 10,000 people took part in Scotland's biggest cycle ride, cycling from Glasgow to Edinburgh and Aberdeen, raising over £100,000 for the STV uh, appeal. And I'm uh, warned that an invite will be coming to all parliamentarians for the uh, next uh, event. Although many of these projects are mainly cycling orientated, walking and multimodal journeys uh, also benefit. For example, community links projects create mostly shared use paths, benefiting walkers and those who depend on motorised wheelchairs as a means uh, of getting uh, around. In terms of road safety, we can't talk about active travel without talking about safety. And as ministers have said many times, one death on Scotland's road is one too many. And we will do all we can to reduce road casualty figures in line with the road safety framework and the targets in that document. With this in mind, we have developed and will publish imminently further guidance on 20 mile per hour limits and zones in partnership with the Society of Chief Officers for Transportation in Scotland. This will provide greater clarity for local authorities on the options that are available to them when they're considering introducing 20 mile per hour speed limits, which will help protect both pedestrians uh, and cyclists. And you will be aware of the term presumed or strict liability, which some organisations are advocating at the moment. And as the Scottish Government has already said, this is a continuing debate which I expect will be discussed at the next meeting of the cross-party group on cycling, which I hope to attend. The Scottish Government's position has not changed if there is evidence that the introduction of some form of stricter liability makes active travel safer, then we will, of course, look at this evidence. I'm running out of time, presiding officer, but I think we've made great uh, progress in the Cabinet Secretary when Minister made great progress in promoting uh, cycling as it relates to rail uh, and uh, specifically and ensuring that the new franchise uh, opens up many of the opportunities for cycling uh, and that has been a real feature in the new contract going forward. Finally, I think it's appropriate to acknowledge the importance of the legacy of the 2014 uh, the Games for active travel as part of an act of Scotland. I'm sure we'll all agree the inspirational performances of Team Scotland's athletes during the Commonwealth Games last summer it will be a fitting legacy to encourage more people throughout the country into more active lifestyles and therefore the local approach uh, is essential. I'm sure we're all committed to ensuring that uh, Scottish people who might have been inspired to watch Team Scotland bring in a record-breaking haul of medals have the opportunity to take the first steps towards a healthier way of living themselves. So a great deal of projects, I could have gone on close, uh, about many more of them. And I want to conclude by saying I don't believe the language is right that there is stagnation, but there is much, much more to do. And let us work together to do that, to support active travel in Scotland. Many thanks.
Now call on David Stewart. Speak to and move amendment 11980.1. Mr Stewart, up to 10 minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, I suspect, though I could be wrong, uh, that uh, consensus will rule supreme this afternoon. But of course, opposition members from across the chamber uh, will endeavour to keep the minister uh, on his toes. And nevertheless, I would like to thank the minister for his kind remarks um, at the start of his uh, introduction. Uh, to continue on my consensus theme, Scottish Labour will support the government motion today uh, and the Green uh, Amendment. However, we will be asking some searching questions around the budget for active travel. President officer, I want to focus on the why question in this debate. On a simplistic level, what are the benefits of active travel? What does the evidence say? I will touch, as the Minister has, on road safety, which of course leads to questions about design in our cities and towns and finish with a section on budgetary issues. We on this side of the chamber are keen supporters of active travel. Labour wants to encourage walking and cycling. We want to promote a culture of active travel more generally. And what are the benefits? The Minister has touched on them. Of course, the wide-ranging personal health benefits, the fact it's environmentally friendly, and the very low cost of free means of transport. Uh, King's College in London have recently completed a wide-ranging study on the health benefits of cycling. Professor Norman Lazarus was quoted in Tuesday's Press and Journal, and I quote, cycling not only keeps you mentally alert, but requires a vigorous use of many of the body's key systems, such as muscles, hearts, and lungs, which you need for maintaining health and reducing the risks associated with numerous diseases. The study examined 122 fit amateur cyclists aged between 55 and 79. The study concluded that many were physically and biologically younger than most people of the same age. And there's also been some recent academic research into the health benefits of walking by collaborating for health. They argue that walking has clear benefits for physical and mental health. However, the number of children walking or cycling to school fell from 62 to 50 per cent between 1989 and 2004 in the UK as a whole. This, of course, could be contributed to parental fear of children being involved in road accidents or general child protection concerns. Physical barriers, of course, may be a greater problem for the elderly, for people with disabilities, or for parents with young children. And what helps? Well, of course, improvement of infrastructure, such as implementing of footpaths and seating areas, highlighting the social aspects of walking, and tools such as smartphones and route planners to provide safe, reliable information to those wishing to make healthy lifestyle choices. And Collaborating for Health conclude that active transport is associated with a reduction in the risk of cardiovascular disease, obesity and higher blood pressure. There's some excellent best practice, Minister. Uh, for example, the walking tube map in London, which shows the number of steps it takes to watch, walk between each station. And I have a suggestion today, President Officer, in my, in my first um, acting out as a transport representative for the Labour Party. Why don't we develop the same one for, uh, map for the Scottish Parliament? We can have a walking uh, route from each member's offices to committees, which tells you how many steps it takes. Perhaps this could be a job for the corporate body. <laughs> Jill Don. I, I, I'm, I'm grateful. I, I, I wonder whether we might also make sure that uh, the, the members get a choice as to which floor on the uh, office block they get to their office, because some of us would choose to be on the top, others might not. <laughs> if the members want to me to nominate members who should be in the top floor, but I certainly <laughs> um, have a look at that. I also think we need to look very carefully at road safety. What does the evidence tell us about trends in road safety for pedestrians? Since 2008, pedestrian casualties have fallen by a quarter, but very worryingly, fatalities have increased by a third. The majority of these casualties um, occur in built-up areas where the speed limit is up to 40 miles an hour. The majority occur in the winter, and the majority were in the evening. And at weekends, the casualty peak times were between, for adults were between midnight and 2 a.m. But very concerning for me as a road safety campaigner, the number of pedestrian casualties uh, uh, were over a quarter for those aged under uh, 16. And just as a snapshot, in 2012, 60% of the casualties were male. And the UK Department of Transport figures show that the annual pedestrian KSI, killed or seriously injured in UK, has been rising recently. And they conclude that on that statistics, walking is more dangerous than travelling in a car. 
There is, of course, solutions. I don't have time, President Officer, to talk about the graduated driving approach, which I've been very actively interested in. But I think we need to develop education schools on road safety, about safe walkway for schools, and better design walkways in towns, cities, and rural areas. And what are the environmental benefits? Well, my colleague Claudia Beamish will go into a lot more detail about this. But clearly, we need to have a modal shift if we're going to reach our 2020 targets on emission. The Scottish Government included active travel as one of the means by which we could reach our 2020 target on lower emissions in Scotland. And of course, substituting short car journeys, which are carbon polluting, uh, with walking or cycling is a relatively easy early gain. It's also important to note that this would have a knock-on effect to air pollution, which attribute to over 2,000 deaths in Scotland per year. It's important then we look much more in terms of numbers, but also the human stories of how bad air quality can have a detrimental effect on people's quality of life. Think of the small child with asthma walking to school, inhaling emissions from the exhausts of their schoolmates' parents' cars. Safety at the school gate would be greatly improved if more people made the trip by foot or bike. I know it's not possible for everyone to leave the car at home, especially for those who live in remote and rural areas. We do, however, need a change of culture and a change of mindset. Active travel is good for a healthier life balance and the environment. I'd like also to briefly touch on how active travel can have positive effects on the economy and personal finances. It's interesting to note that according to the National Household Survey, 22% of households earning less than 10,000 a year use walking as the main method of transport, while only 8% of households earning 40,000 a year do so. So car ownership has been steadily increasing. However, 30% of households still not, do not have access to a car. Many, of course, are low-income households. Many of these without cars rely on active travel methods to get to work or school, but are faced with unnecessary obstacles and dangers, such as badly lit walkways and cycle paths. That means that not all spending on active travel benefits all members of society, but it particularly benefits those who do not have the option of travelling by car. Now, the Scottish Government vision for 2030 has an ambitious plan to increase active travel by 20% and as a target for 10% for all journeys made by bike by the year 2020. We share this ambition. Is the Minister confident that these targets can be met? What obstacles need to be overcome? And the figures in walking illustrate that little has changed since 1999, but shows that we're slightly on a downward trajectory. There's clearly a bit of room for improvement here. And the figures for cycling show a similar trend. We need to encourage people from all walks of life and ages to regard cycling as a reliable and safe means of transport. We have to ensure that young children get the opportunity to learn how to cycle in a safe and encouraging environment so cycling becomes part of their lives. We've already heard from Claudia Beamish the importance of bikeability, having on-road experience. And I recall from 1965 from Merkin School in Inverness, they actually got the cycling proficiency certificate. And I can reassure Alec Johnson that wasn't my only certificate, but I'm working on that. <laughs> it's clear that we need to do a lot more work to be done to create a nation of walkers and cyclists. We need an investment to ensure people feel confident and able to leave their car behind for a pair of shoes or a bike. However, we need to improve road safety, which is why I welcome the Scottish Government commitment to increase the active travel budget uh, in 15-16 and welcome the Cabinet Secretary's commitment to an additional 10 million investment in cycling and walking infrastructures. There are good headline figures, and I welcome the version put forward by government, but we need more than that. Currently, there is little information on where exactly this money will be spent and how much will go directly to improving infrastructure. I would be grateful if the Minister in his wind-up would perhaps give us a bit more detail. And the campaign group spokes have highlighted their concerns that only half the £10 million investment funding will go on improving infrastructure it's also concerned that the ring fence budget given to a local authority for cycling and walking has been cut from 8.2 to 8 million in the current budget. This could have dramatic effects on local authorities' abilities to improve cycling and walking. We know that funding pressures are on local government, but I also like to flag up best practice in the last few seconds. I think um, Edinburgh Labour-led Edinburgh City Council is a prime example of that. In conclusion, presiding officer, I welcome this debate. And I would stress that Scottish Labour has strong support of active travel. We believe that making walking and cycling more accessible will make a substantial contribution to addressing the physical and mental health problems in Scotland. 
We welcome assurances from the Minister that funding is available to meet the ambitions of the various strategy documents, such as the Cycling Action Plan, the Active Travel and the National Walking Strategy. In conclusion, uh, as Lasso said, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks, and thank you for sticking to your time. Now call on Alison Johnson. Up six minutes, please. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the beginning of a new year is a good time to have this important debate. On Twitter, someone wrote in a New Year's resolution sort of a way that this year they'd like to save money, lose weight, improve their health and fitness, get to work on time, enjoy the scenery. And then they kind of scored that out and wrote, I'm going to get cycling. And walking clearly offers similar benefits. A government serious about spending money wisely on outcomes like vastly improving national health and well-being, not to mention boosting the economy, should invest properly in walking and cycling. And since I led the Parliament's first debate on cycling in 2012, it's clear that there are an increasing number of positive local stories around infrastructure, increased training, um, lowering of speed limits in some areas, and the introduction of 20 mile per hour zones in some of our towns and cities. But I do think it is still too patchy. I'm pleased to be able to work on a cross-party basis with my colleagues in the cross-party group. Um, Co-conveners um, Jim Eady and Claudia Beamish um, always input very positively, as do the many external organisations who attend and really make the group the success it is. And I was really pleased to attend a meeting in Parliament where we heard from Soren Rasmussen, an architect from the Danish Cycle Embassy, he told us that while investment in cycling in Copenhagen was initially driven by a need to address pollution and congestion, the number one reason people in Copenhagen gave for cycling was convenience and speed. It got them to where they wanted to get quickly. His slides of cycling Copenhagen style were inspirational. 40% of folk cycling to work in school, university and college. No lycra, no hives in sight. I mean, it's not needed because a critical mass of cyclists is highly visible. Who can miss that endless flow of bikes, pedalling at a conversational speed, arriving to start their day only slightly more rosy-cheeked than if they'd walked? Now, for now, that kind of number, those kind of numbers remain a vision here. But it's essential that we have a really clear commitment to 10% of all journeys by bike by 2020. And let's keep the language clear. If 10% is a target, let's call it a target. Presiding officer, as you've heard already in the debate, we're in the legacy period following last summer's very successful Commonwealth Games. And we know that research showing meaningful legacy, real change following global games is really hard to find. And that's because too often after the games have left town, after people have been inspired by watching the world's greatest athletes in action, after that initial boost in participation, there's been little or no sustained increase in physical activity among the general population. Investing properly in cycling and walking now would help ensure that Glasgow bucks that trend. Because as we know, physical activity can help improve so many health problems, from dementia to diabetes, from fatigue to the risk of hip fractures. A Canadian academic has confirmed that the best preserved 65-year-old may outperform a sedentary 25-year-old. But becoming and remaining physically active is a quality of life issue. And as we begin to fully understand the economic health and societal impacts of our changing population demographic, this is important information. Our population is aging, and we need to do that in an active, energizing way, a way that helps to prevent and delay many of the chronic conditions which blight too many lives. So it's really important that the Scottish Government sustains a clear upward trend in investing in active travel. Relying on consequentials, welcome as they are, doesn't demonstrate the leadership we need on this issue. And the increase in previous years got us up close to 2% of spending, and I urge you to maintain this, surpass this, don't cut investment. Edinburgh Council leads the local authority commuter cycle rates race, and they've done so with a clear commitment to increase spending on active travel by 1% each year until they've reached 10%. And governing is, of course, about choices. As yet, no government in Parliament in Scotland has made walking and cycling a priority. The level of investment says it all. One and a bit percent of the transport budget, a transport budget that has increased massively in the past four years. The new transport minister could be the person to change that. Paths for all, um, briefly. Okay, just to make the point that, uh, is it, would you accept it's not just about money, it's also changing attitudes? 
Um, absolutely, but we've spent a lot of money Johnson. on changing attitudes. We need to have the infrastructure that allow parents and others to feel that they want their children walking and cycling on safe roads. Anyway, um, Pass for All have called for a champion for this cause, and the Minister could be the government cycling and walking champion. Spokes have rightly questioned the clarity of the financial transactions involved in investing in cycling and walking infrastructure. Transform Scotland too speak of the continued opaqueness of the Scottish budget. Why is it so complicated? I ask the government to make this as transparent as possible and to be really proud of the investment. Have a single budget line, have two lines that says walking infrastructure, cycling infrastructure, and at the end of the line, as advocated by the Scottish Green Party, and 110 transport, medical and other professional bodies, including the Association of Public Health Directors, the Institute of Highway Engineers and the British, Foundation, British Heart Foundation, have a figure that is 10% of the transport budget. Can you draw to a close, please? I will indeed, presiding officer. Pass for All are right to point out in their briefing that active travel schemes clearly deliver better value for money than most traditional transport schemes. And they're right too when they say it's time to put into practice to fund what the policies say. So why the ongoing reluctance? I look forward to hearing co colleagues' contributions in the debate. Thank you. Many thanks. And I call on Nanette Milne. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I fear this debate is going to be somewhat repetitive. Um, we, we hear a great deal in this Parliament about the increasing levels of obesity in Scotland today, about the health demands of our rapidly growing elderly population, about the persistent health inequalities which, within our society, and about the serious health risks of an inactive lifestyle. The latter are indeed stark because statistics show that seven deaths occur every day in Scotland, many of them premature, which are due to inactivity. So there's a huge benefit to be had from getting people out of their cars and onto their feet or their bikes, because all the problems I've just mentioned can be helped by increasing the level of our activity as a nation. Walking has no personal financial cost. It's the most common physical activity, and it has many proven health benefits, as we've heard. It helps to maintain bone density. It can reduce the severity of dementia. It reduces cardiovascular diseases by up to 30%. It reduces the risk of some cancers, and it helps to alleviate depression and high blood pressure. Indeed, it's been shown to cut overall mortality rates by up to 20%. And given that obesity is currently estimated to cost the NHS over 300 million a year, we can judge the significant financial benefits to be gained from improving our national health by increasing our physical activity. In a country where over a third of women and nearly a quarter of men do not have a driving licence, and where 22% of households with an income of less than 10,000 a year use walking as their main mode of transport, policies to support walking will disproportionately support low-income households, which has to be a good thing. The more people use active travel, the more they're also likely to walk for pleasure and recreation. With fewer cars on local roads, routes to school and local facilities will become safer for all age groups, but especially for children, and older people will be able to feel more in touch with their communities. So active travel encourages access to shops and services in local centres, and so it helps to support local economies. And as we know, it also serves to cut carbon emissions and other pollution from our communities. So surely an all-round win-win situation. I've so far just mentioned the benefits of walking, because that's what I personally relate to most. But of course, cycling too has enormous health and social benefits. What I've said so far is obviously well known to policymakers. And during the existence of the Scottish Parliament, successive governments and all parties have been committed to promoting active travel as a measure to develop a more active and healthier population. Various strategies have been put in place to try and achieve the ambition. As the motion states, the National Cycling Framework has been in place for 20 years. The first cycle, Cycling Action Plan for Scotland was first published in 2010 and refre refreshed in 2013. And last year saw the launch of the first national walking strategy as part of the legacy of the Commonwealth Games. The active travel vision for 2030 has been articulated, showing how Scotland will look by then if more people in Scotland are walking and cycling on a regular basis instead of using powered transport. So, presiding officer, how close are we to achieving this ambitious vision? Sadly, not very, if we look at current trends as laid out in the briefing sent to us by Living Streets and Paths for All. The government's national performance indicator to increase the proportion of journeys to work made by public or active transport has actually decreased from 31.2 to 30.7%. In 2013, only 23% of such journeys were made on foot, even though half of all these were less than three kilometres. 
the number of children walking to school is stuck at around 50%, with 20% of morning peak traffic still taking children to school, despite the fact that most primary school children live less than a mile and a half from their school. I can, of course, understand parents' fear of traffic when their children want to walk or cycle to school, but the more cars are used for school transport, the busier the traffic will be, especially in, in an area with rapidly increasing housing development as there is where I live. Sadly, too, commuter cycling rates remain very low in Scotland, with Aberdeen, for example, having increased only 1% since 1999 to 3% last year, nowhere near the government's 10% cycle share target for 2020. Edinburgh, as we know, is doing better at 6.6% following specific financial investment, but it's still well behind target too. So funding is clearly an issue for both walking and cycling if the government's vision is to come to near achievement. Local authorities receive government funding for the development of pedestrian infrastructure, but details of how the money is spent on this are not available because it's generally counted as expenditure on roads. And government money is also used for a wide range of sustainable travel initiatives, such as car clubs and cycling infrastructure projects. So it is hard to establish what the Scottish Government actually spends on walking. Revenue and capital funding for cycling comes from the Scottish Government and local authorities, the former under a number of different budget headings, and again, there's a lack of clarity as to where it is spent, which hinders efforts to, deli to deliver the Government's goals. The Cycling, Walking and Safer Streets Fund which is a key source of finance for local authorities to implement active travel and infrastructure projects allocated to councils on a per capita basis, has been decreased from 8.2 million last year to 8 million, I believe. Uh, can, can, I? can I ask the Conservatives what then is your funding position in relation to sustainable active travel and cycling specifically and as it relates to local government? Lynette Milne. I think this is something that actually has to be sorted out between government and local authorities. I just take what I've said. Um, so funding is an issue anyway, which I think does need to be sorted out between national and local government, but it does need to be reliable and consistent if progress towards the 2030 vision is to be realistic. So I will conclude, presiding officer, by saying too much good work has been done in the lifetime of the Scottish Parliament, but a great deal more will be necessary to achieve the active nation, which is not only desirable but necessary. We totally support the government's ambition, and we will continue to support sensible measures to help realise its uh, active travel vision for 2030. Many thanks. And we now move to the open debate. We are very tight for time. I call Jim Reedy to be followed by Sarah Boyer. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Reedy. Presiding officer, I am grateful for the opportunity to speak in this debate this afternoon, although I will confine my remarks, if I may, to the issue of cycling. I recall that in April of 2012, I had the privilege, along with Alison Johnston and Sarah Boyack, of addressing 3,000 cyclists who came from all over Scotland to ride en masse from the meadows to the Scottish Parliament. This was a mass movement. People of all ages and from all backgrounds who came together to make their voice heard and to demand that our roads be made safer and more accessible for cyclists. They had set up their own campaign group, they wrote a manifesto, they used social media and they called for action so that Scotland could become a cycle-friendly nation. This was the first ever pedal on Parliament and it has now become an annual fixture in both the political and cycling calendars. It has been addressed in subsequent years by the Minister for Climate Change, Paul Wheelhouse, and the then Minister for Transport, Keith Brown, as well as being supported by MSPs from across the Chamber. So I'm delighted that cycling has moved from being the subject of protest outside this Parliament to being the subject of debate in government time in this chamber this afternoon. Presiding officer, there are many people who cycle to work or their place of study. They derive the health benefits from this form of active travel and end up saving the NHS money by living healthy, active lives, as we've heard this afternoon from both Dave Stewart and Annette Milne. The environment benefits too from lower carbon emissions. This is a genuine win-win, a win for the individual cyclist and a win for the wider community. Pound for pound, investment in cycling provides huge gains compared to investment in other modes of transport. 
We need to raise the status of cycling and to promote the benefits for individuals and society as a whole. We need to build on the investment in cycling infrastructure in rural and urban Scotland and to sustain this year on year. And we need to encourage consideration of cyclist needs in all aspects of transport planning and transport management. In Edinburgh, we have one of the highest rates of cycling in the country and we have a council which is providing leadership. Edinburgh has responded to the demand from local people for more investment by committing 7% of its transport budget to projects designed for pedestrians and cyclists. And we have a local transport champion for cycling in Councillor Adam McVeigh, who has worked hard to make a real difference. We have seen a number of investments in cycling, such as the new bike corridor from the city centre to King's Buildings at the University of Edinburgh in my own constituency, although many people, myself included, would prefer that this was a properly segregated cycle route rather than being on road. We have also seen the resurfacing of North Meadow Walk cycle path made possible by the allocation of £4 million of funding for shovel-ready projects, which followed the meeting which I secured with the then Cabinet Secretary for Finance, John Swinney. We also look forward to the dedicated cycle path on Leith Walk linking with the wider cycle network. Edinburgh Council have also piloted 20 mile per hour zones and have rolled these out in residential areas, so I welcome what the Minister had to say on the guidance which is to come. There are many more people who would cycle and there are many more people who want to cycle for whom the roads are not yet safe enough. So the safer we make our roads and the more people we will then get out of their cars and onto their bikes. We need to make our roads safer, less congested and healthier for the next generation. I'm also pleased to have played my part in moving cycling up the political and policy agenda as a co-convener of the cross-party group on cycling along with my fellow co-conveners Claudia Beamish and Alison Johnson. We have become our own version of the Three Amigos, whose sole reward is to ensure that justice is done for the cycling community before riding this time by bicycle into the sunset. To quote Steve Martin's character, Lucky Day, what we are talking about is money, real money, amigo money. No dough, no show. And that presiding officer takes me neatly onto the subject of the Barnet consequentials. I called on the Deputy First Minister during questions on the local government finance statement before Christmas to match the City of Edinburgh Council's commitment to, of allocating 7% of its transport budget to active travel and to allocate some of the funds that are coming to Scotland under the formula to cycling. I was pleased that the Deputy First Minister acknowledged the role which cycling can make in meeting the government's own ambitious targets, and I, look very, I very much look forward uh, to that meeting in the near future. Many of my constituents have urged me to press the government to do more, and I reiterate their calls today. One constituent, however, stands out. He said, I had a dream last night, and I hope that Jim Eady can make it come true. He set out a vision of a greener, happier and healthier Scotland as a result of sustained investment in cycling infrastructure in his blog, Uncle Kempis's Edinburgh Blog. Now, it's one thing for politicians to be held to account for the promises they make at election time, but I thought asking me to make his dream come true was perhaps too much even for the MSP for Edinburgh Southern. This was an awesome matter, a matter for the Transport Minister Derek Mackay. Then I thought, no, this must be an issue for the Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure, Capital, Investment and Cities, Keith Brown. After all, my colleague Christina McKelvey tells me that he spends his days making her dreams come true. Finally, I decided that the only person, though, who can make Make my constituents' dream come true is the Deputy First Minister. So I say to the Deputy First Minister, put all other considerations to one side and make mine and my constituents' dreams come true by allocating some of the additional funding coming to Scotland through the Barnet formula to investment in cycling infrastructure. In conclusion, presiding officer, there are thousands of cyclists in Scotland, men, women and children, and they are looking to this parliament for leadership. Cycling offers the people of Scotland so much. Improvements to health through exercise, less pollution and carbon emissions, and a sustainable mode of transport and recreation. I hope that this parliament will take the opportunity today and in the months ahead to define the kind of Scotland we want to see, a cycle-friendly nation of which we can all be proud. Many thanks. Now, call on Sarah Boyer to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This is one of those follow that speech moments, and I am I'm going to choose not to do that for obvious reasons. Um, but I do think this has been a good debate thus far. I want to welcome the Transport Minister to his new job, and I want to focus on three things really. I'd like to focus on our overall approach. I'd like to focus on the distinctive roles that I think central and local government can play, and I'd like to focus, actually, as Jim Media has just said, on the money. 
Um, I think there is, there is clearly cross-party support across the Chamber for doing more on walking and cycling and on active travel. I think the bit we're not so good at is joining up the dots between walking and cycle, between walking and buses, walking and trains, cycling and trains. I would also add in other types of transport as well. I actually think the trunk road network has got to be linked into our cycling ambitions because over time, as more and more people commute longer and longer distances, um, if you look at the cycle statistics in terms of accidents, there are clearly many, many accidents happening in our urban areas. Junctions are a key danger for cyclists. Being overtaken is a key danger. Being crossed um, by lorries or by buses is a key danger. But if you look at our rural roads network, that's where many of our fatalities happen. And it's on roads that drivers are not expecting to see cyclists and are narrow roads and they're roads with lots of corners or lots of hills. So I actually think this is not just an issue, although I think local authorities are crucial. If we're going to have an overall approach to active travel, it's actually got to be every level of government and everybody signed up to that. And as others have said, I thought Dave Stewart's speech, on, particularly on walking, was fantastic. I thought Nanette Milne's comments on health were absolutely right. Um, the fact that the BMA have lobbied us today about this issue just makes the case that several colleagues have made about the importance of active travel for, for our long term. And actually, was I was waking up to uh, Radio Scotland this week, they used the statistic that people in their mid-50s and upwards who regularly cycle have both a better um, biological and physical state than people who don't cycle. So this is not just an issue for young people. This is actually an issue for every age category. And I, don't, I think we quite often focus on young people. That's right in terms of the start. If you don't get the right habit at the start, it's not going to lead on uh, to good habits in the future. But we've really got to be taking a whole population, whole country approach to this. So the policy is absolutely crucial. There is cross-party support. There needs to be work at the central and local level. And both levels of government playing their part. But at the end of the day, the political will has got to translate into money. And I was just looking at the first budget uh, the first transport minister had in this place. Um, that was under £300 million. And we've now got a budget of £2 billion. Now, if you track across walking and cycling, um, it obviously doesn't actually um, go up from 99 because the major investment didn't happen in the first year. It happened in the years thereafter. But the cycling and walking investment has in no way kept pace with trunk roads, it's not kept pace with railways and it's not kept pace with ferries or air or buses. So there is an issue about, because cycling is a lot of small projects, it's much harder to get the big political hit and the big shift behind it. So I think across the chamber, we've got to agree that we're going to do that. And, and that means, I'm afraid to say, Transport Minister, it means all of us piling into you and saying we need to do more and then being prepared to support you when you do start putting more money in. Um, the First Minister accused uh, opposition parties at the last FMQs before the recess of not being supportive enough on climate change when controversial issues are raised. Now, honestly, has walking and cycling got to be seen as controversial? It's relatively small amounts of money. It's incredibly local. It's very good for public health benefits. Um, and it's good for the economy. We don't say enough of that. Promoting cycling and walking is also good for the economy. So... For me, it's got to be about infrastructure. Exhorting people is not enough. Sometimes there are a small number of people who might feel guilty, who might feel on that day their public health will be better if they get on their bike. But the truth is, for most people, they want safer environments. For people to be comfortable walking and cycling, we've got to make the built environment better. So a challenge to Alec Neil, he's just called in 1,200 houses in Edinburgh to determine them by the Scottish Government. I want to know what those planning applications are all approved in detail. They do have excellent cycling and walking routes that link back into the rest of the city. We need to make sure every development, every new development, whether it's housing, whether it's business, whether it's education, has the right level of cycling investment and active travel investment. And that means networking into the rest of the, the town, the city or the village. Um, it was absolutely right, I think, for Jim Eady to praise what Edinburgh is doing. The radical rollout of 20 miles an hour zones, um, actually some streets should be doing well to get up to 20 miles an hour, but that as a principle will help um, promote the ambition for many people to cycle. But it needs to be followed up by 
dedicated cycle routes. And I think that's something the Parliament needs to turn its mind to. If we have um, cycle markings on the road and cars can park in the cycle markings, then it's part-time cycle routes. It's not full-time cycle routes. That's a challenge across the country. So I think we need sustained investment. We need higher investment. Edinburgh's commitment of 7% of their city's transport budget um, is close, excellent. Please. But we need that ambition shared across the country. And I have to say that the Scottish Government needs to be doing more to lead the way. More clarity, what spokes have asked for. More clarity so we can track the money. That's absolutely essential. Um, and when the, the Minister comes back next time, I hope the, con the motion is less in terms of self-congratulation and a bit more in terms of what we can all do to meet the challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Tavish Scott. Up to six minutes, please. Uh, let me start by congratulating the Minister on his appointment to the most exciting, uh, in the Chinese sense, uh, <laughs> portfolio in, uh, in government. Uh, I shall continue to get my prayer mat out on a weekly basis to pray that all snow that falls over the winter will be at no lower a level than 1,500 feet, thus ensuring the satisfaction of skiers and the clear roads which will enable the Transport Minister to sleep at night. Now, looking at the motion and the amendments is quite interesting and revealing. Uh, government motion makes three references to cycling and two references to walking. Uh, the Labour Party have achieved a perfect balance. It's 50-50. Um, the Greens seem to be a bit obsessed about this strange cycling thing. There are five references to cycling and only one to walking. And I'm here to redress the balance a little bit because I am perhaps not the committed cyclist that some of the rest of you are. I can tell you uh, that today I have so far done 7,500 steps. My walk from here to uh, the railway station tonight will complete the 10,000 steps target, and yesterday I did 15,000 steps. Now, that only adds up to about 15 miles a week, and that sounds quite decent. Uh, my nephew, however, uh, I, I have to say, who used to be a, a world-class uh, orienteer, his training schedule used to be 160 miles a week, so I can go a bit further. But a lot of the debate is focused on, if I may suggest, at the risk of being characterised as a grumpy old man, entirely the wrong thing, and that is investment in infrastructure. Nothing to do with this whatsoever. Ministers love investment in infrastructure. They'll do it Every pound you can give them, they'll go off and spend it on infrastructure because they love to go and open things, be photographed beside a new bit of cycle track, be photographed at a new bike hire station, be photographed uh, putting a new name on a, on a train. The reality is we've actually got to change what goes on inside people's minds. If you were uh, to think about, for example, buying, uh, buying shoes that were suitable for walking, for a million people in Scotland. How much would that cost? Actually, less than the annual active travel budget. And would that deliver in health terms and in improving people's engagement in active travel a greater benefit than spending any money at all on cycling? But I just say that to provoke, not because I realistically propose in any sense that we decommit on cycling. I just say, Let's think about what a pound spent on something actually buys in public policy terms. And a pound spent on walking buys a heck of a lot more than a pound spent on almost anything else in the active travel area. And I'd like to see us do something about that. By the way, walking can be a sort of rather flexible thing. Uh, there's a guy, and I keep meaning to somehow get him to stop so I can find out who he is and what he does, who in my area, He's both in my constituency, but I more normally see him outside my constituency, who on the main road roller skates. And he actually uses it as a means of transport, because I've actually seen him um, do 10 miles on roller skates. So, you know, it's not just shoes. We've maybe equipped people with roller skates, and that's good, healthy exercise as well. So I've heard no mention up till now in the active travel budget of roller skates uh, for the population of Scotland. Perhaps we should, should have a little uh, think about that. The bottom line is, you know, in these debates, we've kind of got to challenge the norms. So maybe, you know, let's look in the mirror as members here. How many of us 
today came to this parliament in a taxi. Roller skates. If you know more about roller well, skates than I do, and that will not be hard, most certainly. It, it, Mary it, Fee. It may be a point to help il illustrate the, um, in the debate. In, in a previous life, when I worked for one of our largest retailers, when they were rolling out their, their opening of their massive big superstores, they gave some of their staff at the checkouts roller skates so they could manoeuvre their way around the store a bit easier. So that might be something we should be talking to our retail friends about a bit more. Stuart Stevenson, can I remind the Chamber we are very short of time this afternoon? I am keeping a very close eye on the watch and your steely gaze, presiding officer, uh, simultaneously. Um, I, I'm, I must say Nanette Milne gave us great heart that if we get engaged in this exercise thing, um, every thing we do will improve our life. I, I sort of have the feeling that I might uh, have the grave misfortune if I continue my present exercise because I don't use the taxi uh, to lift 150. Uh, but that's OK. I'm, the, the other thing I may say on cycling, which I've genuinely looked at, and I, I was actually on the point of going ahead about it until my wife saw what I was looking at on the, uh, on the internet. I was looking at monocycles. Because they're quite easy to carry around, they're quite cheap, and they're easy to maintain. And I thought it would uh, scare the heck out of people here if they saw me uh, on a my monocycle. We've got a clear choice here when we spend money. And I genuinely say to the Minister, yes, we've got to invest in infrastructure, and we should continue to do that. But what we've actually got to invest is in changing the hearts and minds of the people of Scotland. Because almost everybody's got the equipment to engage in walking, and they've got it right now. It's going to be raining heavily when this parliament finishes its day's business, but I still want to see you all walking to Waverley, if that's where you're going. Presiding officer. Many thanks. Before I call Tavish Scott to be followed by John McAlpine, can I just indicate that we are incredibly tight for time, and if members could take less than six minutes, that would be helpful. Tavish Scott. So can I also welcome Derry Mackay to his new position as uh, Transport Minister, but also as Islands Minister, which uh, and I might try and bring more of a, a rural and islands perspective to this uh, thoughtful debate uh, this afternoon, because uh, that's maybe an issue that hasn't been, um, hasn't been quite brought to the fore as yet. Uh, it does strike me that there's a number of ex-Transport Ministers in here tonight, and I think we'd all uh, say to the new one that um, this is about the most powerful lobby out there. You, know, you think the Rose lobby is hard, you think the Rail lobby has a lot to say, but actually, uh, I think Alison Johnson might um, know this too, as well, that uh, the cycling lobby actually uh, is both vigorous and determined, but actually provides uh, an intellectually coherent argument, which sometimes doesn't always come, dare I say it, from some of the other uh, lobbying organisations. Alison Johnson also challenged um, the new minister to be a champion for cycling. I recall Sarah Boyack cycling to cabinet minute meetings uh, in Butte House uh, back in that first term, so maybe I can encourage uh, Derek Mackay to get on his bike in the nicest possible way, of course, not in that um, tepid way that uh, we might remember from a previous political life as well, uh, but to get on his bike and, and, and uh, cycle, and indeed as Stuart Stevenson encouraged him to walk uh, everywhere as well. There is quite a lot about leadership in this area that the minister, um, all ministers, but uh, this minister in terms of this portfolio probably can show uh, more than, uh, than any, anywhere else. Um, the timing of the, of the debate has been mentioned by others, and I, it's a bit intriguing to discuss cycling and walking. There won't be many school kids cycling home in Shetland tonight, I can tell him, because the uh, forecast the next couple of days, as you'll well know from, uh, from his resilience responsibilities, is absolutely terrible, which will allow me to escape on a plane tomorrow night, otherwise I won't get home until Sunday. But the... Um, the point about that is, is as I think uh, members from Edinburgh and Jimmy D particularly made this point, that I think it's easier to devise some of this policy agenda uh, where it logically fits into cities and urban areas than it is in rural areas. And that's why uh, the councils in rural areas who have achieved so much in terms of the teaching of what we used to call cycle proficiency uh, in um, schools are to be commended. And some of the numbers that are in the briefing papers that we've had for this debate, I think, are, are particularly uh, to be uh, supported uh, where rural local authorities have uh, invested uh, considerable um, time and effort into making sure that teaching uh, of, of uh, cycling skills is available uh, in primary schools and at a young uh, age. And Annette Mill mentioned the obesity figures. Now, there's some I found today that were published, I think, by the Parliament's Research uh, Centre. Now, you can probably bandy around the figures, but it, uh, the number that I was given today 
suggest that obesity costs the economy something like in excess of £4 billion a year, which is an enormous number. I mean, it's quite, it would be quite interesting to see quite how the economists get to that kind of scale of uh, number. But whatever it is, uh, the, the, that is the challenge for any government. It's certainly the challenge for um, the incoming uh, minister, with one in three of our children at risk of being overweight or obese, and one, of, one in three adults thought to be obese. So that does, if nothing else, and the economic number that others have mentioned, support the contention that uh, the economy benefits too uh, from a realistic and uh, sustained investment in active travel point that in fairness to the minister he made in his opening remarks. The other um, aspect I do think that the minister might do in those, no doubt they still have those cross-portfolio meetings I used to so beloved when I was in government. Um, oh, many a day was wasted in those. I never thought I'd get those days back either. I never did. But the, um, I'm sure they're much better now. But, the, um, uh, uh, but I could encourage the minister maybe to take on in those kind of meetings the challenge of PE in schools as well because there's a, a big role for our, uh, for our education ministers in uh, taking that forward. I'm going to start banding around all the statistics around PE in school, but there's a, uh, there's a healthy debate um, on, on that in itself. Uh, but it strikes me that that is a, a very much a linked factor in terms of the active uh, nation that the minister rightly is trying to uh, create. Uh, he encouraged all of us to uh, mention um, projects that work. And let me bring two uh, to his attention. The first is the Shetland Community Bike Project, which is a, a really great initiative because it takes uh, people who are having a tough time in life and in society and, and encourages them and has them working on uh, very basic uh, things such as maintaining bikes and, and uh, putting bikes back together and then making them available for sale uh, in Shetland. Uh, they work with such organisations as uh, Skills Development Scotland's uh, Young Employer of the Month um, programme uh, to ensure and, in, uh, and ensure there is employment and volunteering opportunities for young people who do face those barriers to work. And that seems to me the kind of social enterprise that is not only a great resource for uh, my constituency, but is actually the kind of project that I'm sure exists in many other parts of the country as well and links to so many positive outcomes, not just for the people who are involved in a project, but obviously uh, for many others. I have personally donated a bunch of my kids' bikes to that project, and they did a great job patching their decrepit machines up and selling them on. And uh, I'm not the only dad in Shetland who's done exactly, uh, exactly that. The other one I wanted to bring to Parliament's attention is the Shetland on Wheels project, which just simply aims to promote active travel and ensure that uh, there are opportunities for children and young people in bike handling, bike maintenance and road safety skills, which I think was the point that Stuart Stevenson made about, or maybe not Stuart, but one of my colleagues was making about, uh, about uh, road safety and the wider arguments uh, there. Now there are, in winding up, signing off, sir, um, many uh, campaign organisations, as I mentioned at the outset, who lobby hard on this, and the Minister will have read all the briefings as much as the rest of us uh, have. And I, I thought the, the, the one figure that did seem to me that uh, out of all the briefings that we had over, for this debate that did seem to me uh, quite important to bear in mind was actually from, uh, the Rambler, from Ramblers Scotland who simply observed that since 50% of all journeys in Scotland are under five kilometres are undertaken by driving, there is much scope for improving that into cycling and walking. Many thanks and I now call on Joan McAlpine to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Is your card in, Ms McAlpine? Thank you very much. Thank you again, <laughs> Presiding Officer. Uh, my daughter recently moved to the Netherlands and I visited her there in October and it was a complete revelation. Um, as uh, we know from briefings, 27% of journeys are made by bike in the Netherlands. And I have to say that when I was there, it felt like a lot more because I was in Delft, which is a town which pioneered Holland's active travel culture. You immediately notice that it's much quieter and that there are more people out and about because cycling means more walking. Uh, there's less cars to put you off. One of the most extraordinary sights was getting off the train at The Hague, one of the biggest <laughs> cities, and there was a, a football-sized pitch uh, space for bikes, thousands upon thousands of bikes. And my daughter lives in a block of modern flats in the suburbs of Delft, and there are no parking spaces reserved for residents, but there's a huge communal shed for bikes. On the first day we took, I know this is hard to believe looking at me, but we took a 20 kilometre round trip to the neighbouring town uh, by bike 
like. And for most of the journey, which is through the Greenbelt, we were on a two-way cycle path that was no, nothing to do with, with the roads. And Sarah Boyack mentioned uh, rural roads and the dangers to cyclists. So you don't see cyclists on those kind of roads in the Netherlands because there are dedicated bike routes between towns. Um, and also in Holland, every major road has a two-way cycle lane with a barrier and crossing places for bikes just like pedestrians. But you don't need to stay in these segregated lanes for long because there's a massive complex of urban cycle routes that get you from A to B far more pleasantly. And when you do need to share the roads with cars, like in the narrow streets of historic town centres, they creep along and are few and far between. And I later discovered that these are designated home zones with a seven kilometre kilometer an hour speed limit where cars have to yield to bikes and pedestrians. Now, when I came back from Holland and wrote about my experience with the, the zeal of the converted, so to speak, I had two reactions, one from the cycling lobby demanding that we, induce, the, we introduce presumed liability right away and we become like Holland, and the other was from petrol heads who argued that the Dutch cycle more because it's flat and it would just never work here and that they were historically more inclined to do so. On presumed liability, after much thought, I believe that until we have segregated cycle areas and a more comprehensive system of cycle-only routes, I can't see it working here. Uh, in Holland, a motorist needs to be pretty reckless to hit a cyclist because the twain seldom meet. And drivers on Holland's big roads don't need to worry about cyclists weaving in and out of traffic, as motorists do often in this country. And cyclists are, are policed more in Holland. They, they get on the spot fines if they don't have lights or bells, and if they're, if they're on a road with their which is reserved for cars. Now, as the petrol head argument doesn't hold any water either. Uh, the idea that the Dutch are somehow genetically programmed to cycle more, that's completely untrue. Holland is flat, but it has other uh, topographical challenges like the water that's everywhere. You have to, you know, um, design the infrastructure around all the waterways. And looking back at the history of, um, of, of this topic in Holland, before World War I, the bicycle was the main mode of World War II, rather, the bicycle was the main mode of transport in both the UK and Holland. If you, you just need to think back to pictures of, you know, district nurses and postmen cycling around, uh, around our country. Uh, after the war, both countries saw rapid development of urban areas, new housing, and indeed the rise of the motor car. And it was worse in Holland than it was here because they had quite a lot of wealth after the war from their natural gas. And uh, they had twice the number of children killed uh, on the roads than in the UK. And that was the trigger for change there. The 1960s saw the rise of a mass movement called Stop the Kindermord, which is, translates as Stop Child Murder. And it got its name from the headline of an article written by a journalist whose child had been killed. And the movement immediately caught the imagination of government, who for 50 years then designed their whole their towns and their whole infrastructure around cycling and walking um, so we have a huge amount of catching up to do um, it's left us with huge challenges. I agree with Alison Johnson that my experience of Holland tells me that we do need uh, to invest in infrastructure, but we have the reality of a 26% cut to Scotland's infrastructure budget. Uh, of course, we could reallocate from the roads budget, but for politicians, I think we have to, we have to face up to the reality of that. Um, how would um, our constituents react to us telling them that we're going to stop filling in potholes and we're going to build segregated cycle lanes. I think it would be a brave politician who did that, but I think we are, we are at least... Yeah, have... OK, brave politician. Minister. It really just allows me to, to make the point that cyclists use roads as well, so spending in roads isn't necessarily a bad thing for cycling generally. I have miraculously found a little bit of time, so I can reimburse oh, you slightly. Thank you, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Yes, um, yes I, I agree with that, but I think um, we, haven't in, we haven't invested in the kind of uh, infrastructure the segregated infrastructure that would make me feel safe cycling in this country or that would encourage me to send my children to cycle to school if I still had children of school age. I just wouldn't do it unless they were all completely segregated from traffic, I'm afraid. Um, and that's where perhaps uh, part company with the idea that if we just train people to cycle more and get more cyclists on the road, that somehow there'll be a magical transformation. There won't be a, I believe we need infrastructure investment and... Uh, and uh, perhaps it will take a brave politician to get on his 
her bike and Ensure Scotland goes Dutch, but perhaps we have one in front of us. I certainly hope so. Thank you very much. Many thanks. And I now call Claudia Beamish to be followed by Mike McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to start with a call to ensure that active travel is a robust part of contributing to our climate change targets. The step change to a low-carbon economy is a challenge for all political parties, involving long-term planning beyond each political cycle. And the second RPP uh, focuses our minds on the longer term, and we must all work, in my belief, to ensure that proposals become policies to meet the future annual and long-term targets. With transport contributing a heavy bulk of our greenhouse gases at emissions at 21% in 2012, active travel must make a significant difference in future years uh, while also meeting the 10% active travel target by 2020. This is partly about political support for behaviour, as we've heard from others, but this change cannot happen unless the right circumstances are created by a robust range of initiatives, building on what Scottish Government, local, go local government, NGOs and other voluntary groups have already done. We have already heard about many of these in today's debate and the, from the range of excellent briefings. But the point I would make is this, that in order to move forward in a significant way, it is not about the development of on-road primary school cycling education through Bikeability Scotland, nor about on-road segregated cycle lanes, nor about changes to civil law to better protect cyclists. It is about all these things in tandem, if I may say. I will focus particularly on cycling as I am a co-convener with, uh, with Alison Johnson and Jamidi of the Cross Party Group for Cycling, though I am starting to feel that despite the large number of CPGs, there maybe should be one for walking as well. However, active travel does offer significant opportunities for trans-departmental financial commitments, and I do believe this is vital as we have heard from some today. The complexities of this opportunity are better known to those in government than to a shadow minister. However, who would pass up the chance to enable people of all ages to cycle in reasonable safety, helping them to get fit or keep fit, helping with their sense of well-being through being out in fresher air, and helping them to get home or to work or to school or for leisure with no car queues and air pollution on their journey? or perhaps not no, none of it, but um, at least much less. Of course, transport, environment, health, education, local government, justice and planning uh, have something to contribute. And I'm pleased to hear that the new minister will be liaising with the planning department in this spirit. As a rural dweller, I want to say something specific about rural cycling. Three years ago, I went along to a Lothian cycling breakfast, walking at that point, at the city chambers here in Edinburgh. As I was the only member of my party there, I was asked to say something and feeling slightly panicked as I had walked rather than cycled and feeling myself outnumbered by urban cyclists by hundreds to, to one as a rural cyclist, I said that I thought rural cycling was important too and somebody clapped. Sarah Boyack has called for a whole country approach and this is vital. Since then, I've heard a lot about good rural cycling initiatives, not least the joining up of the National Walking and Cycling Network, one of the 13 infrastructure projects in NPP3. And to give two quick examples, um, South Lanarkshire's local transport strategy has committed funding on a phased basis year by year to add, to add links into this network and other cycling commitments. And the Clack Manager, Manager Council has created its first cycle-friendly road with 40 mile an hour limits and signs saying cycle-friendly road, please drive with care. Can the Minister say more about rural cycling commitments in his closing remarks? As a rural dweller, I had never cycled in any city until about a year ago and was very trepidatious. My cycling buddy, which I would highly recommend, helped me to make a start. And I did still get off, I, I still do get off um, when I come to Toll Cross to walk, but do cycle along the Union Canal that haven't yet fallen in um, under the bridges and across the meadows. But while I have moaned about how unsafe and unprotected I still feel despite my helmet and new yellow cycling rain gear, so many people have said to me, it's a different cycling culture in other European countries. But it had to start somehow in Holland to reach the critical mass, as we've heard from Joan McAlpine and others. So many people cycle there, at least some of the time, that they might well also understand, have some understanding as car users and respect cyclists as well. 
In my office, I have a photo of a mass lie-in by cyclists in the mid-70s in an Amsterdam square. Of course, I'm not advocating stopping car traffic and having a mass lie-in. Pedal on Parliament is sending a clear message here. But I would say that cyclists uh, do need to feel safer, especially in, in a family setting, uh, if they are going to really take to the roads and make us a cycling nation. I have noted the efforts of ScotRail uh, in their briefing in relation to uh, cycles on trains, but I do hope that the new Abellio contract for, um, will include far more bikes on trains to aid tourism and commuting, and commuting in the borders, and that this will be a shining example. Finally, I want to say something about the roadshare campaign for presumed liability. Strict liability has actually existed in France since the 1960s. At Pedal on Parliament last year, I made a commitment to raise this issue with Scottish Labour and have done so with vigour. I will continue to do so and look forward to Roadshare's European research uh, results, which I hope will build on what some regard as the incomplete Scottish Government findings. And I do believe that this could be a way forward uh, which everyone could look at across the chamber, but only as part of a range of cycling initiatives which will make us a cycle nation. There's much to celebrate for active travel already, but without the funding for this range right across the country, we will not be able to all cycle safely. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Mike McKenzie to be followed by Cara Hilton. President Officer, I'm pleased to speak in this debate, not least because its importance is reinforced by the number of organisations who have sent us briefings. And the briefings all seem to have one thing in common. They all support and indeed commend the Scottish Government's Cycling Action Plan. And they all support the, the, the first national walking strategy. And they all support the Government's aims of improving health and well-being and reducing carbon emissions through increasing active travel. The second cycling action plan introduces a target of 10% of everyday journeys to be made by a bicycle by 2020. And it is a fact that it is perhaps inconvenient for opposition parties that this government has got a habit of delivering on its targets. I'm pleased also to see the proportion of adults who meet the recommended physical activity levels increasing from 62% in 2012 to 64% in 2013, and the proportion of children meeting the recommendation of at least 60 minutes of exercise per day, rising from 71% in 2008 to 75% in 2013. These are real achievements. And it's also an impressive achievement that the government is able to commit significant funding for active travel initiatives and infrastructure against the terrible austerity background that we face with a 26% cut to our capital budget. And I know that there are some arguments that more should be spent in infrastructure and less in promotional initiatives. However, active travel is at least as much about changing our sedentary culture and attitudes as it is about providing infrastructure, as my colleague Stuart Stevenson noted. Yes, a very quick one. Alison Johnston. Um, surely the member recognises, though, that while promoting the benefits of active travel are clearly very important. If you have a campaign like Give Me Cycle Space, but parents don't feel the cycle space exists for their children to, to cycle safely on the road or indeed to walk safely to school, that money is going to be wasted. It's not going to have the impact we would wish. Mike McKenzie, I can reimburse you. I would, I would invite, I would invite uh, the member to get out to some of the wonderful cycling, route, cycling routes across the Highlands and Islands that I'll speak about later. And I note that there are some arguments that just suggest that much more should be spent on all aspects of active travel. But as always, those who suggest this never ever say where the corresponding cuts ought to be made. And I note that as we approach the UK general election, both the main UK parties are promising even more austerity and even deeper cuts. And in all of our debates here in this, in Parliament, in this Parliament, it's impossible to ignore that fact. President officer, I do agree, however, that more can and should be done to facilitate active travel. And I'm pleased that the National Planning Framework 3 commits to a national walking and cycling network. And I'm delighted at the success of walking routes like the West Highland Way and the Kintyre Way. And I'm also enormously impressed at the Sustrans network stretching 
in the Highlands, all the way from Kintyre to Inverness and beyond. And I would suggest to Alison, come and visit the Highlands and bring your bike. Active travel in the recreational sense is especially important in the Highlands and Islands, all the more so as distances involved in travelling to work or school in rural areas are often too great for active travel to form such an important part of everyday travel as it does in urban areas. Indeed, in the area that I live in, active travel was often, in the not too distant past, about getting off the bus when it came to a very steep hill and sometimes actually helping to push the bus up the hill. And active travel was sometimes about helping to roll our ferry boat when the engine broke down as it used to do quite frequently. So active travel in the Highlands and Islands is often quite a different thing from in urban areas. And on the subject of planning, I do feel that much more can be done at the local level. I was glad to hear Sarah Boyack touch on that. And that local planning authorities need to consider active travel carefully as they work in local development plans. And this requires a fundamental change, I think, in mindset and in culture. Because for many years, we've followed a, a model of development that is highly dependent on the car. And within a couple of generations, we've gone from a walk to work, walk to the shops, walk to the pub, walk nearly everywhere society, to one that now demands that we all have to travel longer distance, distances. And in the course of this, we've lost much of the dynamic of our local communities of our town centres, of our cohesiveness as a society. We must take a long-term view of this and see if we can put right some of the mistakes of the past. And I'm suggesting an, an evolution here rather than a revolution, because I do believe that that's the only realistic way we can do this. And in terms of the outcomes of active travel, we're making real progress in terms of health outcomes, in terms of well-being, and in terms of environmental targets. And some of these targets will not be met in a linear fashion with steady progress year on year. Often progress happens in leaps and jumps. Electric vehicles, for example, are about to breach the technological threshold that will revolutionise and decarbonise much of our transport. And I expect that when this happens, it will happen much more quickly than we might imagine. Presiding officer, there is no magic bullet in achieving the many desirable outcomes of active travel. And in fact, it's the multifaceted approach that the government is following across a range of portfolios that is paying off and will continue to do so. Many thanks. I now call Cara Hilton to be followed by John Mason. Um, thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak in um, today's debate on the active nation. Increasing our rates of walking and cycling is not only good for our health and good for our well-being, it should also help Scotland uh, meet our ambitious targets on both air pollution and carbon emissions. However, there's still a lot of barriers to becoming an active nation which colleagues have discussed and which we need to address. The reality is that most journeys are still made by car. Many families have got busy lives and simply don't have the time to walk from A to B. As a society, we work the longest hours in Europe. Many families have got complicated childcare arrangements to juggle. And to be fair, I think our weather can be a factor in putting some people off from active travel. It can seem to, it can often seem too complicated and indeed too dangerous an option. Um, there's simply in some areas, there's just not the safe paths or cycle routes. And Scotland is still a long way from becoming an active nation, lagging way behind um, the, our, um, our colleagues across Europe in terms of active travel. So if we're going to achieve the 2030 vision we all aspire to, then it's going to take a lot more than warm words. And I know we're all united across the chamber in wanting to make um, the active nation a reality. But it's got to, um, active travel's got to be given greater priority. It's got to be properly funded. And we need a lot more action to encourage behaviour change and healthier lifestyles if we're going to make walking and cycling a realistic and attractive option for everyone. Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, same question to the Conservatives. If the position is that active travel isn't properly funded, at what level does Labour think it should be funded at? Well, I mean, the issue my constituents are raising is that the Scottish Government have got the power to fund active travel now. You should be using that power to make a difference um, now. Um, and so what we all aspire to be an active nation, Scotland faces an ever-growing um, obesity problem. It's an epidemic that's costing our NHS £300 million a year, cost to society and the rest of the economy in terms of sickness absence, much, much more. According to NHS 5, one in five primary one children in my constituency in Dunfermline is overweight or obese, and a staggering one in three adults in West Fife is obese. Yet only a third of adults do 30 minutes of physical exercise a day. And increasingly, we've got a generation of children who spend more time playing on the Xbox or in PlayStations than they do out on their bikes. A screen-based lifestyle in which the average child spends two and a half hours a day watching TV, and apparently, according to one briefing that I received, 20 hours a week online. Living Streets in their excellent brief and highlight the loss of freedom that this has um, produced for our children, who have within three generations gone from being able to roam freely for one and a half kilometres around their homes to being limited to just 0.25 kilometres, often not getting out of the sight of their, ch their parents, being driven elsewhere by their parents to ride their bikes rather than riding around the, st the estate where they live. And I'm sure I'm not alone in the member that well, when I was a child, I used to go out all day on my bike with my friends and you would only come back when you were hungry or when it got dark. On the train today, I read a report by the National Trust called Natural Childhood, which I would urge colleagues to have a look at. The report warns of the social, medical and environmental problems we're storing up for the future if we don't take action now to reverse the inactive indoor lifestyles too many children lead. Walking or cycling to school, work or for shopping is one of the easiest ways that we can achieve the recommended physical activity levels at any age. And we're making progress, but more steps need to be taken to make walking and cycling a safer and easier option for all. Many schools in my constituency are playing a brilliant role in promoting active travel and I'd like to pay a particular mention to Carnegie Primary who launched their active travel plan in June and are doing a brilliant job in encouraging mums, dads and children to walk, cycle or, so or scoot to school. Across Scotland, local authorities too are taking um, positive step forwards despite the budget challenges that they face. Um, investing in active travel to make it not just a vision but a reality. Fife Council, for example, is making huge steps forward to create a cycling kingdom with major programmes already planned across the region to increase the number of cyclists and achieve the 2020 target. In Dunfermline, Fife Council are investing £2.2 million on new and improved cycle routes, including a, pro a proper traffic-free route to link Resyth train station with Dunfermline city centre. And the Lindbourne Corridor project, which will see a new cycleway and footpath connecting the eastern expansion to the city centre, and improvements to Dunfermline's existing miles of cycleways, making cycling to work, to school and to sport and for leisure an easier, safer and more attractive option. And this is going to be combined with free cycle training for both children and adults of all ages, cycle instructor instructors in every school in Dunfermline, even free bike repair and maintenance courses. Dunfermline's ambition is to become a cycling city, and I look forward to this being realised. But more still needs to be done. Many of my constituents raise with me the fact that they commute to Edinburgh every day for work. And one of the big concerns that they have is that the new flagship Halbeath Park and Ride facility is very difficult for either pedestrians or cyclists to access safely. Unless you arrive by car or by bus, there's simply no way for local residents to get there. So more action is needed to make our transport hubs accessible and to make leaving the car at home a real option for commuters. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, I look forward to the Scottish Government to taking further action to improve cycling and walking infrastructure. But the constituents who have contacted me in advance of this debate are looking for genuine investment, not for warm words. The Scottish Government has got the power and resources to act, and my constituents want to see concrete steps to make the active nation vision a reality. In their briefing for today's debate, Living Streets estimate that delivering active travel provides £8 of benefit for every £1 spent, an investment that delivers real award rewards for our nation's future health, for our quality of life, for the very air we breathe. And it might even help us achieve our missed climate change targets too. So it's time to be more ambitious, time to give active travel the priority. Scottish Labour will continue to hold the government to account and make sure that that vision becomes a reality and that we become the active nation that we all want Scotland to be. Many thanks. And I now call on John Mason to be followed by Alex Strowley. Hey, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, I have to say this is one of the subjects where I do feel very uh, committed to the concept, uh, but where I do feel a few feelings of guilt uh, along the way. Uh, so maybe I should start off with the latter and confess that I do have a car and I do not enjoy cycling. 
Uh, however, I do like walking, and I will mainly focus on that. Today's debate is not about public transport, as it, in itself, sitting in a bus or a train is no more active than sitting in a car. However, I would suggest that almost inevitably, public transport does encourage a more active lifestyle. If I travel to Parliament by train each day, that involves, uh, for myself, around 45 minutes of walking, in contrast to coming by car, which involves no minutes. So as well as being better for the environment, public transport is generally also better uh, for our health. However, that does require that public transport is available within walking distance of our homes, and I fear that has not always been the case with new housing developments. But there are good examples, and I think we should note them, such as Broom House in my own constituency, where the First Minister lives. She is within walking distance of Bailison Station on the newly electrified Whiflet line, and I certainly know that she has travelled that way in the past. I'm not sure how much she manages to do that at the moment. Now, the suggestion has been made that a key to more active travel is spending more of the total budget and more of the transport budget on infrastructure for walking and cycling. Now, I would suggest that this is partly true, but only partly. It is encouraging to see more cycle, tracks, eh, cycle racks at railway stations and elsewhere. The cycle rent, rental scheme, in, eh, such as in Glasgow, do seem to be having a very positive effect in the early days. And I fully support dedicated cycle lanes and other ways of helping cyclists get priority or at least some protection compared to other road users. Similarly, pedestrians can be helped in various ways, for example, to feel safer with more white street lighting, as Glasgow was introducing, but which seems to have stalled recently. A particular bugbear of mine is how long pedestrians have to wait to get a shot at crossing the road at traffic lights, when the road vehicles seem to get repeated turns first. Yet the fact remains that many of us could be walking on perfectly good pavements in well-lit areas, but we are not doing so. Clearly, there is more to this than the physical infrastructure. We also need a change in attitudes. I have neighbours who see me leaving the car at home and seem puzzled why I prefer to use the train or bus. There does seem to be an assumption, at least among some people, that it is a sign of your success to use a car rather than walking or using public transport. We've all heard of people walking several miles to get to a food bank, and that is a separate issue that needs to be dealt with. But it does tend to link walking with failure in some people's minds, whereas driving to a supermarket is seen as a sign of success. I've forgotten the name of a film I saw a few years ago, but one of the scenes has stuck in my mind. Two guys were traveling in a bus with huge windows, and one says to the other, the reason they make the windows so big is so they can see us poor people using the bus and laugh at us. Again, the suggestion was that public transport means failure, car means success. Now, I'm not sure how we change such deeply rooted attitudes like this, but change them we must, even if it does take time. Now, just at today in today's Evening Times, member may have seen a re report about the Go Well Research Programme, which has produced an 88-page report focusing on the east end of Glasgow. And it also suggests that walking is one of the best ways of increasing activity levels. Some of the points it makes include uh, walking costs nothing. It can be part of a daily routine. It requires little extra time and be, can be accomplished even by people in quite poor health. Only 52% in the East End felt safe walking alone in their local area after dark, as opposed to 61% in Glasgow overall or 68% across Scotland. Vacant and derelict land puts people off walking. On cycling, there was a positive note. 5% of folk in the East End use cycling as their main transport to work, which is better than the 2% across the rest of the city. However, they do consider the focus on cycling is less applicable than walking, appealing more to men than to women, and a bike being a considerable expense for a low-income household. There are, they mention less glamorous day-to-day -day matters are important and contribute to a safer, attractive environment, including street cleaning, lighting, and ensuring cycle paths and pavements are unobstructed and safe to cycle on. And in their school survey, quite encouragingly, they find that walking or hiking for exercise was commonly listed as a weekend activity by S1 pupils. However, this was more the case for pupils in affluent areas, and much less so, especially for boys in more disadvantaged areas. Now, my own personal view on this would be that we still have a problem with territorialism, especially in the east end of Glasgow, and a fair number of boys are unwilling to leave their own immediate area, especially on foot, for fear of being set upon if they try to walk through someone else's territory. 
Uh, can I just mention at this stage to uh, pay tribute to Tom Weir? I think he made walking in Scotland's hills and countryside uh, popular for many of us, and perhaps especially for those from a working class background. And I think it was fitting that a statue was recently erected to his memory. Presiding officer, speaking personally, I know I benefit hugely from walking, not just physically. In fact, the physical mental division is somewhat artificial, as I think Richard Simpson mentioned yesterday. If you ask me to sit down and relax, I basically cannot do that. But if I go out walking for the day, I can relax. I can also think, about, think things through, I can reflect as I walk. And add to that, you feel more part of a place when you walk rather than being cocooned in a car, a bus or a train. So, presiding officer, I highly recommend active travel and especially walking. And perhaps I myself am challenged to be a bit more active by today's, today's debate. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call Alex Shirley to be followed by Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. Can I also congratulate the Minister in his, his new role? Um, and I look forward to working with him. This has been an interesting debate today. I was thinking to myself if, um, if we could get fit by just simply having strategies, then we would be a fairly fit nation, given you know, there's, there's, there's quite a lot of strategies here for cycling and walking. And if you then took local authorities, I'm sure there's lots of strategies sitting out there within local authorities. Um, and that, that should tell us that it's, it's not just as easy as, as having strategies and that we need to do a lot more. The minister highlighted a number of projects, and I did want to highlight a project or a, a business in, in my own constituency, Dave's Bike Shed. Um, I was reading through the, the website and, and a quote it says, I don't see bikes just as toys or leisure sports equipment. I see cycling as a way ahead from where we are now with expensive transport costs, chaos and congestion. Um, and I would pick that up because I also read a Fife Council paper um, that recently went before their council and they say the case for being physically active is strong. Um, with a direct correlation between physical activity and the risk of heart disease and stroke. Physical uh, inactivity is the fourth leading cause of death worldwide. And that, I think, highlights why we need to take a more cohesive approach in terms of um, how we move forward with the, the, the cycling and, and walking. And I think, you know, Alison Johnson highlighted the point about infrastructure and indeed Joan McAlpine um, said on the same point that, that, that she would be concerned for her family um, going cycling and that we need to have more investment. And I think that's right. And it was highlighted that in terms, Sarah Boyack highlighted that in terms of the actual transportation budget, um, in terms of the infrastructure and investment in cycling and walkways, that has not kept up with the level of investment more generally. Um, and that needs to be looked at because if we're serious about, um, about having um, more people being physically active and if we're serious about coming any place near to deliver on some of the strategies that we actually have, then we certainly need to have more investment. Fife Council make the point that physical activity impacts positively on our mental health and well-being, promotes community cohesion, sustainability, sustainable development, and through um, active travel such as cycling and walking. Walk they go on to say that more needs to be done, however, and they highlight ensuring that there is a focus across all organisations and in services on achieving um, increases in physical activity. And that type of partnership, I would suggest, also has to be a partnership between government and between government and local government, and then taking that out into communities. The Council go on to say, enabling local communities, organisations and services to better understand what makes a difference in terms of increasing physical activities is really important. And supporting services and organisations to work together within communities to do things differently in order to increase physical activity. So at a time where we see 
major cuts taking place in local authority budgets. And at a time when we see the Scottish Government budget, as the Minister will point out to me, being reduced, then it is a time where we need to look at all the resources that are available out there. Some of the projects that I have seen um, being developed have been, as the Minister mentioned, been able to pull down monies for elsewhere to match fund the monies that's available. And I think we need to look at how we can focus and do that better. But also we need to look right across the public sector, the community health, the community partnerships, community planning partnerships. We need to be looking at how they focus on this. For example, um, NHS staff um, should be able to, to highlight, and I know in some cases, in, in many cases, I assume NHS staff will be highlighting the importance of physical activity for patients, uh, both in terms of hospitals and primary care. Um, Community-wide physical activity programmes involving multiple settings and sectors, ensuring communities are involved in the design and delivery of a range of programmes and activities. There are walking clubs, cycling clubs out there. So as part of the community planning partnership in terms of health and wellbeing, these strategies need to be understood and need to be at the, the core along with the local authorities. Um, we also need to ensure that there is effective consultation taking place with individuals and groups in developing programmes and activities, physical activity work and programmes to address health inequalities in areas of deprivation as a priority. Um, John Mason mentions the Highlands and Tom Weir, rightly so. Um, but it's very difficult if you are on low incomes to actually go and stay in the Highlands and enjoy the scenery, enjoy the walking, because it can be quite expensive and, and quite costly. So we do need to look at how we access the bike shed, for example, um, that I mentioned earlier in my constituency, is able to build bikes, is able to support. There's other projects some aware in Fife, where people can go and get second-hand bikes. So, in terms of overcoming inequality and poverty, um, it can cost you to be active. It might not cost you to, to, to go out walking, but it certainly can, can cost you to be active. And we've got to be able to evaluate what is going on evaluate the strategies that are there. If we are spending a lot of resources um, to try and drive this forward, do we know what's successful and are we evaluating what's, what's successful and what we can do? I was also interested, I mean, the Minister did say that we need to do much more, much, much more, um, and, and I appreciate that honesty. Um, he is, he is, after all, um, the minister that can bring, can bring forward um, further investment. And it is clear that we do need to have further investment. Am I starting now, to close, please? You can, you can jump up and down and ask what other parties will do, but, but you are the party that is in government. And if we're going to deliver these investments through partnership and by spending the money that we've got, but we will need further investment um, to make this work. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the last open debate speaker is Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. Over the last year, Scotland has hosted two of the great sport, sporting events which were watched by billions across the globe. These events showcased the best of Scotland and what we had to offer. But more than that, we as a nation must ensure that there is a positive, long-lasting legacy from these events. Part of this legacy must be that people of Scotland become more active in order to tackle the various problems affecting the country. Physical inactivity results in 2,500 premature deaths in Scotland each year. This amounts to seven deaths a day, costing the NHS around £91 million annually. Being physically active can prevent and treat more than 20 chronic diseases, which in turn helps alleviate some of the pressures on our NHS. It has been estimated that by getting Scotland more active, we will increase life expectancy by more than a year based on our current level of activity. We need to take advantage of this. Once in a generation opportunity from the Commonwealth Games and the Ryder Cup to here and now and beyond. Together we can achieve lasting change by increasing the number of people choosing to travel actively across our, all our communities as part of our, of our everyday lives, whether that means getting to work, picking up shopping, or visiting friends. By creating communities where active travel is popular, we will produce many favourable 
outcomes for the people of Scotland, including better health, having safer communities and increased economic activity. Unfortunately, we cannot achieve this overnight, and it will require many sectors to work together, such as planning, regeneration, economic development, transport and education. As well as that, President Officer, this Government, I am sure, are aiming to increase investment in active travel, despite an overall capital budget decrease by 26 per cent, meaning that partnership will be even more important. So working together with a wide range of partners from local authorities, NHS, local businesses and volunteers working together in order to achieve a lasting positive legacy of active travel in Scotland. One way in which this Government, in partnership with other bodies, is helping with the promotion of active travel is their vision in a document called A More Active Scotland, building a legacy from the Commonwealth Games, in which it outlined the fact that five years on from the 2014 Commonwealth Games, there will be more workplaces with active travel plans established. Furthermore, in 10 years' time, it is hoped that active travel will be the norm for all short journeys to and from work. With these partners working together, a long-term vision for Scotland will see communities shaped around people, with walking and cycling the most popular choice for shorter, everyday journeys. There are more people taking up active cycling. Travelling by foot or cycle or with a personal mobility aid should be a realistic option for all local journeys. I found it very surprising to learn that one in every three car journeys made in Scotland is under two miles, and almost a quarter were a mile or less. Is that because we're nipping down to a local shop? Why don't we just walk? The facts are that short journeys cause more pollution. Active travel must be seen as a healthier and safer alternative. Increased support for active travel will lead to a reduction in carbon emissions and other pollution across Scotland resulting directly from more people choosing to walk and cycle in their everyday lives. I am sure the Government is committed to promoting low-carbon transport as part of their climate change agenda. This is one way that we can all help. In my central Scotland region, we have lots of great outdoor spaces and parks. And the point that was made by Mr Rowley a minute ago in regards to you know, how much it costs to go somewhere, it really doesn't cost you anything to go and walk out in your local, your local park. That was the very part, Strathclyde Park that hosted not only the Commonwealth Games triathlon event, but the first event of the entire Games. And rightly so, this park is a fantastic place for leisure, from cycling to running, jogging or walking. The park is a perfect example of Scotland's many outdoor spaces and one which we should be encouraging people to enjoy. If you take a leisurely walk along the circumference of Strathclyde Park, I found it astounding to find out it's nearly six miles in length. On the loch, you can see swans, geese, and also watch sailboats on the waterfront. With various excellent facilities in the park provided by NL Leisure and also Scotland's national theme park, MNDs, which is located by the loch. There are also many play and picnic areas provided for families and their children. To enjoy. If we can promote the concept of active travel, then we'll be well on our way down the road to the objectives of this Government, such as a better health, safer travel for everyone. This, in turn, will promote healthier lives, chance, uh, choices, treat and prevent disease and redu reduce health inequalities. Scotland is a country that is well provided for its natural beauty and activity. Many beautiful sites, many beautiful places to walk and cycle. West Highland Way to the Clyde Walkway, there's no shortage of places to go. We do need to get off our couches and enjoy all that Scotland has to offer. And in finishing, I will say, so what are you waiting for? As Sir Chris Hoy said in a recent advert, get on your bike and enjoy Scotland's rich outdoors. Many thanks. We now turn to the closing speeches, and I would expect all members who have participated in the debate to be back in the chamber for closing speeches. I call on Alison Johnston. Six minutes, please. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed this afternoon's debate. It's been you know, a, a good start to the new year that we are debating this important subject in government time too. 
I'd probably like to focus, first of all, on Jim Eady's contribution, although parts of it I'll leave for Jim Eady. Um, I think Jim Eady eloquently described Pedal on Parliament, and I hope that the new Transport Minister can attend this year's Pedal on Parliament. It will take place just outside this building, um, on the grass, on April the 25th. And I know that all the cyclists and pedestrians who attend that event calling on the government to show leadership and investment in active travel would warmly welcome him there. People attending Pedal on Parliament are, are all AJs from all walks of life, and they clearly demonstrate that cycling and walking isn't a minority recreational issue, but that it's a sensible and supportable means of transport, but means of transport that remain overlooked and underfunded. Nanette Milne pointed out that some 40% almost of women don't have a driving licence in Scotland, and that one in four men don't have a driving licence. Many Scots can't afford to run a car. Many Scots don't want to have to run a car. So investing in walking and cycling really is investing in a just transport system. We do have a motion before us today that paints, uh, I feel it paints a very rosy picture because the percentage of active travel journeys has stagnated. Too many pedestrians and cyclists have lost their lives or been injured on our roads and progress towards the CAPS target of 10% of journeys cycled by 2020 is practically non-existent. Transform Scotland demonstrate that walking rates in Scotland have flatlined with the rate at 13.2% in both 2001-2 and 2012-13. So a decade on and not much progress, though things are better in some of the cities. But Dundee and Glasgow have particular challenges there to catch up. Cycling rates in this country remain very low, with the exception of Edinburgh. Transform Scotland say we welcome the Scottish Government's decision in this debate to draw attention to recent advances in active travel policy. Paths for All say that their principal call is to put into practice what policies already say. And I think there's general, there's a consensus around this chamber, there's consensus among NGOs and amongst all those campaigning organisations and individuals that we want to get on with investing in active travel in this country. Sarah Boyack was right to note that small projects often have greater benefits for the local economy than large. You know, cycle routes can really boost, boost profits for small local building companies who might not have the, the means to deal with procurement at that national or international level. We have spent a great deal of money on behaviour change, and I can assure you that those who attend Pedal on Parliament are well aware of the campaigns, of the advertising message, they want to get on their bikes, they want to get on their feet, and they want to use safe cycle paths, safe roads. We do need to start looking at exemplar, segregated projects in this country. We, um, when we hosted um, Mr Rasmussen from the Danish Cycle Embassy, we asked him what, what the one thing he would do if he... Um, not at the moment, thank you. Um, what the one thing he would do if he came to Scotland, and he said, invest in one exemplar project... The impact that will have will be notable and governments and local governments will then be convinced that this is a sensible thing to do. I'm not sure I agree entirely with Stuart Stevenson's um, contribution. I do think ministers in particular like investing in some infrastructure more than others. Um, expenditure on motorways and trunk roads has increased by 36%. The transport budget has increased, but we see no similar increase in investment in active travel budgets for infrastructure. Um, very briefly. Stuart Stevenson. Um, would the member recognise that for about three million a year you could put one member of staff in each council to encourage uh, conversion to active travel? Murray have one member of staff, exemplar achievement. It actually is much more about people than it is about projects. Alison Johnston. Um, I think it's about people, but I do think we need to have the infrastructure on the ground to make it safe for people to walk and travel by bike and on foot safely to work and education. Cycling too, let's not forget the economic benefits of cycling. In parts of the world where cycle paths have been introduced, Dunedin in Florida, a stagnating little town, 35% shopfront vacancies. They invested in the Pinellas Trail, shopfront vacancy, non-existent now, 100% occupancy has had a massive impact on the local economy because there's an understanding, there's plenty of research done, cyclists spend more in the local economy than those who are driving by. 
I think it's fair to say that if local authorities follow the government's lead, we're not going to reach this 10% by 2020, and we need to do that. I welcome the Minister's openness to research and to, to look again at research into presumed or stricter liability, and I support Cycle Law Scotland's call for a commitment to this as part of a package of measures to boost cycle safety. Um, Joan McAlpine was quite right. Safety is frequently measured when people explain why they don't cycle. Um, as a politician, I'd be more than happy to call for a redirection of spending from trunk roads to active travel projects. I think, too, we have to get to grips with our roads maintenance backlog. Our roads are unsafe both for, for drivers and cyclists. Pothole, potholes are a problem regardless of the vehicle you're in. Um, I do believe and summing up, presiding officer, that we can achieve transformational change with political will. And again, I'd say that I'd like to work on a cross-party basis with all who are serious about grasping the many opportunities investing in cycling and walking brings. Thank you. Many thanks. Before I call Alec Johnson, can I note that a previous member mentioned Sarah Boyack, who unfortunately doesn't appear to be in the chamber. Therefore, I take the opportunity to remind members they must be in the chamber for closing speeches if they've participated in a debate. Alec Johnston, six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, this has been an excellent debate in which uh, we've worked our way through a great deal of policy, uh, and I think that it has much to commend it. Of course, the Conservatives uh, are committed to active travel as a principle, and as already been uh, mentioned by Tavish Scott, it was a 1980s Conservative Minister, Norman Tebbit, who first encouraged people to get on their bikes. <laughs> The, however, when we consider the situation we have in Scotland today, uh, many of us walk uh, and many more should because we have wonderful countryside. But nevertheless, the topography and the climate of Scotland are perhaps <laughs> less conducive to cycling in some areas. While cycling up a steep hill in the pouring rain into the teeth of a gale may be an excellent metaphor for my job as promoting Conservative policy in the Scottish <laughs> Parliament, it is perhaps not the way most of us would like to arrive at work in the morning. However, there is a, a serious matter to be discussed here, and we have heard a number of people talk about issues that are key to cycling and walking. And of course, the health benefits are one, something that has been highlighted by many people, including my colleague Nanette Milne. The fact is that those of us who can take a more active uh, part in transporting ourselves around the country, uh, even for relatively short periods in the day, do benefit uh, in health terms from that little bit of extra activity. In fact, those who are less able, uh, some who are perhaps leading a less fit lifestyle, will be much healthier if they can spend half an hour a day taking some active exercise, whether on foot or on a bicycle. There is, of course, uh, an issue of education here, uh, and I think it is important that many of us understand that there are people out there uh, my experience perhaps is with cyclists, but not always, who use the roads in such a way as to antagonise other road users. Uh, as a pedestrian, I was once almost knocked to my, uh, on my back by a cyclist on the road outside this very parliament. Uh, as a driver, uh, I am entertained by some of the antics that uh, some rather irresponsible cyclists are willing to become involved in when they are out there uh, on our roads, particularly uh, in denser traffic. I think it is important that we emphasise the need to educate cyclists and have them behave more responsibly. In that vein, I would like to congratulate Aberdeenshire Council for the exceptional effort they are making within schools uh, to promote the education of young cyclists to make them more responsible on the roads. But, uh, yes, indeed. Claudia Beamish. Does the member agree with me that it would be good to educate the odd motorist as well? Alex Johnson. Uh, I would argue that we do have a, a training and testing system in place for motorists, and that should take into account the issues that we discussed there. Many of our cyclists uh, have received little or no training. However, even those who have had training, uh, there is the safety issue, and that's something that we need to take very seriously indeed. I'm fully supportive of moves to increase the number of 20 mile per hour zones uh, in our towns uh, and cities. 
It is, however, concerning that I believe there may have been a vote in Edinburgh today uh, in favour of uh, bringing uh, in a blanket 20 mile per hour limit across the city. And I'm not convinced that that kind of action uh, puts suitable emphasis on the key areas where we must maintain lower speed limits uh, and that complacency itself may result in less safety in some important areas. However, the one area that we have discussed uh, through this whole debate, and which I must address specifically, is that of budget. I am fully aware that budgets are tight. However, I would commend the Scottish Government for the work they have done to ensure that funding has been made available for active travel. In fact, I can give a guarantee here that should I find myself voting against the budget this year, it could be for many things, but it will not be for what the Scottish Government has done in relation to active travel, which I support. Of course, there are those in the Chamber who would like to see much more money spent. And one of the reasons why I'll be unable to vote in favour of the uh, Green Amendment tonight, uh, one of the few reasons why I will actually be abstaining, uh, is that it doesn't give a timescale for some of the commitments it gives. I actually support the, the, the demands that are made there to see uh, funds returned to the active travel budget and increased over the years. But the lack of a timescale means that I cannot support uh, that concept. I cannot make that demand uh, in this, uh, the current budget period. As we also uh, look at the priorities that the government have identified, uh, I think it is important that local government take their share of responsibility. Therefore, I think, uh, as many have said, it's important that local government accept that responsibility, ensure that money allocated from the Scottish Government for this purpose is used for that purpose, and that local government itself makes contributions where it can to improve the infrastructure uh, and the support that walking and cycling receives. In specific terms, I've heard many people in this debate talk about the need for separate infrastructure so that cyclists can be kept away from busy traffic. And I think that would be a vital step forward if the budget can be found in subsequent years to achieve that. Interesting the suggestion that there should be some exemplar project brought forward to demonstrate that. However, in closing, I can give a commitment that the Conservative Party remains committed to active travel is supportive of the government's position, uh, will support the uh, Labour Party's amendment tonight and will abstain on the Green Amendment, believing that it has much to commend it, but that perhaps it's not quite uh, what we're able to support tonight. Many thanks. And to now call on Mary Fee. Eight minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I start by welcoming Derek Mackay in his new role as Transport Minister, and I look forward to working with him in the future. Scottish Labour supports Scotland becoming an active nation. We want to see a healthier population, a healthier climate, and a healthier country overall. And the Scottish Government motion today is a, a non-contentious motion which we support, although some questions remain over the funding of walking and cycling, which is why we lodged our very small amendment, which I am very happy to hear that the Government will be supporting. And I am happy to work with the Government further mm. to get a bit more clarity on budgeting and funding. We also support the amendment by the Green Party, which reiterates our call for clearer funding, and we note the reference made in their amendment to the debate on presumed liability, which we would be happy to further engage in. And can I also take this opportunity to thank the organisations who submitted the briefings for today's debate. And while all encourage and give support to active travel, they do raise some concerns around funding, planning and leadership. And actions do speak louder than words. And for active travel to become a realistic prospect and a priority of the Scottish Government, it must be supported by the funding required. And that funding must be presented in a clear and open manner. Yes, certainly. Minister? Is the member aware in relation to the road network, Scottish Government is actually responsible for 6% of the road network and local government the rest. Therefore, there is an equal question of this agenda of shared responsibility that Labour-led councils and other councils contribute substantially to this shared agenda. Mary Fee. I, I absolutely agree with the Minister that it is um, a, a shared agenda. And can I follow on with... Um, 
uh, with my contribution. And with the honest critique that I've given, um, and as the new Scottish Labour Shadow Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure, can I make the government benches this promise? That when our paths do align, and that pun is intended, Scottish Labour will commit to working with the Scottish Government and other parties in this chamber on infrastructure areas such as active travel. However, neither I nor my colleagues on these benches will hold back when questions must be asked and decisions need to be challenged. And, Presiding Officer, I want to thank the Transport Minister for his opening remarks. And in closing, I hope that either he or the Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure can respond in kind to the remarks made by our members this afternoon. My colleague Dave Stewart in opening predicted this would be a consensual debate, and indeed it has been a consensual debate. Going back to the theme of funding, we recognise that the current funding pressures on local authorities, as already highlighted by the Minister, will impact on active travel decisions at a local level. And speaking with many colleagues in local government, I acknowledge and have concerns about the pressures placed on them to protect the most vital public services, such as social work and schools, above the interests of the active travel programme and agenda. And that doesn't mean that councils are not focusing on active travel, as the Labour-led Edinburgh City Council has shown. It has committed 7% of its transport budget to cycling for this financial year. As the, the local authority area, which has the highest level of cycling and walking rates than any other local authority area in Scotland. And can I particularly at this moment single out the contribution by Jim Eady this afternoon? I always enjoy Mr Eady's contributions. I'm not going to comment on his uh, remark about dreams coming true, because I'm not doing that today. But his comment about the three amigos, you'll be happy to know, Mr Eady, I now have a mental image of the three amigos cycling off into the distance. Um, Sarah Boyack spoke about finances and budget, and Annette Millen rightly raised the issues of health benefits. And to Stuart Stevenson and John Mason, can I say this? I too am a walker. I have always been a walker. My father was a walker. Um, I regularly, at least once, twice a week, went walking with my father. And his two favourite expressions to me were, it's only another couple of miles. And his other expression was, you've not broken sweat, you're not walking fast enough because my father's walks were roughly about 15 miles, so there was no gentle stroll for me. And contributions from across the chamber today have been positive, supportive, and it is rare where we have a debate where across the chamber every single member agrees with the government vision. And the long-term vision for active travel in Scotland is an ambitious one. And I would, however, like to see more direction on how we achieve the goal. And in its written submission to the ICI Committee's 2015-16 budget scrutiny, Sustrans Scotland warned that the Cycle Action Plan for Scotland's vision of 10% of everyday trips by, by bike by 2020 is challenging but not impossible, with will at all levels underpinned by financial commitment. And of that quote, the last two words are the most important, financial commitment. Sustrans also point out that the positive policies such as the CAPS and the National Walking Strategy provide limited success in increasing active travel. Research shows that the number of people participating in active travel has remained stagnant over a number of years, with the average number of walking trips and total distances showing a downward trend since 2001 and 2002. And that may have something to do with perceptions around safety, and it's something that we should be looking further to. And David Stewart rightly picked up on road safety as a key barrier to encouraging more walking, and the government rightly recognises road safety as a barrier through the Designing Streets document, which puts pedestrians at the heart of street planning. And one death in our roads is one too many, and we will work with the government to tackle fatalities on Scotland's streets and roads. And, presiding officer, can I also welcome any measure to get more children cycling in, in, in schools, as we know they have a major role to play. But can I ask the Minister what assistance is provided for schools in some of Scotland's poorest communities, where the luxury of purchasing bikes may not be at the top of a parent's wish list? And Cycling Scotland reports that 38% of primary schools are now offering Bikeability Scotland on-road cycle training, up from 32% three years ago, which is to be welcome. 
And going back to affordability, we know that the best performing councils, such as East Renfrewshire, Aberdeenshire and Shetland, don't experience the same levels of child poverty as other local authorities, especially in the central belt. My colleague Claudia Beamish rightly pointed out the impact that transport has on our greenhouse gas emissions, sitting at 21% in 2012. Active travel can make a significant difference. However, as Claudia Beamish also points out, we need a robust range of initiatives to make change happen. The National Walking Strategy acknowledges the barriers to increased walking activity, as polling by Ipsos Murray last year revealed there are four perceived barriers, weather, health, time and distance. However, I would point out if you're going for a stroll or a strut, a saunter or a run, then you are doing more to Scotland's performance than you may think. And finally, presiding officer, I repeat my earlier promise to the government that where Scottish Labour can support the Scottish Government, we will. Where we disagree, we will put forward our arguments to explain, and I look forward to working with and both debating with the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister in future debates. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Derek Mackay to wind up the debate. Minister, you have ten minutes. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I think this has been an incredibly constructive uh, debate uh, where a number of very valid points have been raised. I'd also like to welcome Mary Fee to her post as Cabinet Secretary as well uh, as, as Dave Stewart. Uh, on the uh, first uh, point around budgets, ultimately I've agreed to the amendment. Parliament will vote on it. If successful, we'll publish that uh, information. Hopefully that will be helpful. But I would again make the point that there are many more budget contributions to active travel than that which the Scottish Government is responsible for. And it only tells one part of the story, but it's a story I'm more than happy to tell so it can further challenge what we're doing in partnership to realise the vision in which there is great consensus. We've moved beyond in this Parliament debating why we have a vision or why active travel is important to what we're actually doing. And that's the critical issue that we've been debating uh, this afternoon. And I was looking for Jem's new ideas, and some have actually come from the debate that I will take forward and questions posed. I won't be able to cover them all substantially. But actually, Alison Johnston's key point about the expert, forgive me, I didn't get the name, around what would you do if you could do one thing in Scotland and it was have one project as an exemplar that shows what can be done. That is something I'll certainly, I'm very sympathetic to because I think that will help us with this critical mass point about showing the difference that can be made and use that to encourage other parts of the country. But I would say in credit and fairness to Edinburgh City Council that there are great projects in the Labour-led authority, by the way, the SNP is part of that administration too, and as I understand it, it's an SNP councillor who's the cycling czar or champion, I just throw in. Um, in terms of that, there is an exemplar project which the Scottish Government is supporting, but I absolutely agree that some exemplar projects will showcase what we can do in terms uh, of active uh, travel. It's partly about budgets, partly about investment, partly about culture change. Many members are right. It's about all of them uh, together. And announcements have been made by the government in terms of Sustrans investment, Cycling Scotland, smarter choices, smarter places, the financial transactions that will try and make work. And if it doesn't, we'll supplement it as we've committed to do in money for cycling, walking and safer streets, as well as the settlement uh, to local government and funds out with the transport portfolio as well, such as the climate change fund. There are a range of funds that can support the kind of projects that you would want uh, to support. And Alison Johnson, uh, to return to the point about it being too patchy, well, it will be if we believe in localism, which will allow local partnerships and local councils to come up with schemes that are right for them, but making sure we've got the connections across the country, hence national planning policy, national planning framework three, uh, the cycling strategy, of course. Alison Johnson. Where that some local authorities spend none of their own finance on such projects. And when a government is spending less than 2% on active travel, it perhaps doesn't send the kind of positive, optimistic message to local authorities that this is an important issue for investment. Minister St Johnston knows we are not a centralising government, so I won't tell local authorities to how to run their budgets. But I will, I will absolutely, at the ministerial 
summit created by my predecessor that I'll attend, and long before it and all the engagement I have, it challenged local authorities and how they are supporting this agenda because it's a shared uh, vision. Therefore, it's a shared approach as to how we take it forward. And, and roads maintenance is actually another example you mentioned. We're actually maintaining the roads is important to cyclists and other forms uh, of active uh, travel as well. So the funding regime is complicated, but I will put energy into realising the vision rather than accountancy exercises. But if we want further transparency, then that is something that the government, I, I believe, will welcome because the headline manifesto commitment it will be met in that in 11-12, 1.8% 1 of the total transport budget was, was spent on sustainable and active travel. And this will rise to 2.5% in 2015-16 on current spending allocation plans. Uh, but much more to do. Some members have criticised the self-congratulatory uh, nature of the motion. I thought it was a very generous and modest uh, motion in that it, the only government it thanks is every government since 1999, not just the current government. I've even praised the, the Labour Party. Uh, that's absolutely correct. External partners and others, because this is uh, about partnership work whilst recognising that the strategies have to be delivered through investment, uh, new ideas and a kind of commitment uh, that's been outlined, I think fuelled by uh, all members in the uh, debate uh, today. Uh, the reason <clears throat> there is some difficulty with the green investment is around calling for substantially increased funding. I'll always support more uh, investment into sustainable and active Travel, and that's why I tried to probe any member who said at what is the appropriate level, what is the investment uh, that is sought to have a clearer understanding of that in addition to what the government uh, has committed to. In terms of road safety, uh, this has come up. There will be further campaigns around uh, road safety, uh, such as Give Me Cycle Space and, and a range of campaigns to try uh, and address uh, those matters. In terms of trains and the the integration of public transport and, and active uh, travel. The new franchise to reassure Claudia Beamish, who specifically asked about this, for cyclists, uh, a bill of ScotRail will build on the success of the Stirling Cycle Hub and will deliver more than 5,000 cycle spaces at stations across the rail network, 3,500 of which will be in place within the first three years of the franchise. And of course, both ScotRail and Caledonian Sleeper Service will continue to carry cycles free of charge. More information, more capacity. I think all of that is to be welcomed uh, going forward to assist with the multi-modal shift uh, that has been suggested. On uh, David Stewart's point uh, around uh, best practice, of course, I'll pick up as much of that as I can. And that will feature in the monitoring report due for February on 20 mile per hour zones, advice to local authorities, that uh, advice from government is as imminent as it can uh, be and hopefully that will assist local authorities who want to take this uh, agenda uh, forward. In terms of uh, Stuart Stevenson, I think was correct to make a point around rebalancing the debate to walking uh, as well uh, as cycling, as important uh, as it is. And, I enjoyed Jim Meady's uh, story about uh, his constituent who dreams about him, which to members who have just arrived in the chamber ask questions later. But it was about, about behaviour change in relation to active uh, travel. Tavish Scott's right to identify the cycling lobby as, as uh, uh, very proactive, and I welcome that and their ideas and how we take the agenda forward. I actually have visited the Shetland Community Bike Project in my previous uh, ministerial post and it is an excellent example of bringing together social inclusion and public transport as well. And I'd also commend Shetland because uh, the levels of um, pupil education around cycling are actually second to none, even with the constraints that are presented in the islands and, and, and Shetland is to be and the point around tackling childhood obesity, of course, is important. Yes, very briefly. 
Th I thank the Minister for taking the intervention. Uh, could he comment broadly um, on rural cycling uh, as commitments from Scottish Government, as, as I requested in my, uh, in my own speech? That would be helpful. Thank you. Minister. Which will help me make the point uh, that I've made of a number uh, of members. Because of the nature of the road network in Scotland, Scottish Government is responsible for just 6%. But this shared responsibility about active travel is all-encompassing. So I make the point that community planning, which will be led by my colleague Marco Biagi, will ensure that transport and active travel features within community planning, our relationship with local authorities and transport partnerships as well. So when I and government will take my responsibility seriously, in supporting active travel, but in all those areas, urban and rural and in island authorities, we work together to deliver the vision. That vision that commanded so much consensus today will be about delivery around infrastructure, behaviour, culture, good ideas, and in all of that, if we can continue the approach uh, that we've embarked on today, I'm convinced that we will be able to deliver uh, on that vision of a healthier, greener, culture change which also supports the right transport options that are good for individuals, that's good for communities, good for Scotland and in that sense I look forward to the ongoing engagement around active travel. Just to remind members once more, this is my first debate as Transport Minister and it starts with active travel and I hope that sends a very strong message to all those interested in active travel in Scotland. Thank you, Minister. I didn't want to stop you in full flow, uh, but can I say to members who are coming into the chamber that it is really rude to come into the chamber, talk among yourselves and drown out what the Minister is saying in his winding up speeches. I notice the ones who are applauding that are the ones that made all the noise. <laughs> so that concludes the debate on active travel. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 11996. In the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a revision to the business programme for Thursday the 8th of January 2015, any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 11996. Moved. Thank you. No member is asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, I now put the question to the Chamber. It, the question is that motion number 11996, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of business motion number 11982, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a business programme. Any member wish to speak against motion, press the request speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 11982. Moved. No member is asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 11982, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of two parliamentary bu bureau motions. I'd ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 11983 on committee remits and motion number 11984 on substitution on committees. Moved on block. The question on these motions will be put decision time to which we now come. There are five questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is amendment number 11980.1 in the name of David Stewart, which seeks to amend motion number 11980 in the name of Derek Mackay on active travel be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is amendment number 11980.2 in the name of Alison Johnson, which seeks to amend motion number 11980 in the name of Derek Mackay on active travel be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast votes now.
The result of the vote on amendment number 11980.2 in the name of Alison Johnson is as follows. Yes, 43. No, 60. There were 11 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is that motion number 11980 in the name of Derek Mackay as amended on active travel be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to vote. Members to cast the votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 11980 in the name of Derek Mackay is as follows. Yes, 111. No, 3. There were no abstentions. The motion, as amended, is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 11983 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on committee remits be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 11984 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on substitution on committees be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We are now moving to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.